It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We've got Jason Heiner from, uh, well, he's got a brand new job. I'll let him tell you about it. Dwight Silverman from the Houston Chronicle. Microsoft's Christina Warren. What a great panel coming up to celebrate the 12th anniversary of the iPhone. We'll say goodbye to Sir Johnny Ive. And you can kiss your Microsoft eBooks goodbye. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech. Episode 725, recorded Sunday, June 30th, 2019. Uber's in the mud. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Calm, the number one app to help reduce your stress, relax your mind, and help you sleep. Get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash twit. And by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Captera is software selection simplified. Visit Captera's free website at captera.com slash twit. And by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with the Cashfly content delivery network and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by LegalZoom. Check out LegalZoom today to see how they can make life better for you and your business. Visit LegalZoom.com and enter Twit at checkout for 10% off with LegalZoom's limited time friends and family discount. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Show where we cover the week's tech news. Oh, a fun panel this week. Jason Heiner, my old friend, formerly of the Tech Republic, now officially editorial director at CNET. He's in charge of the advice side, which is reviews. Jason Heiner, great to see you again. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And now you have a corner office with a garden behind you. I mean, obviously, this is a major promotion. <laughs> it's the same office as because oh. I'm still with CBS Interactive, but oh. uh, but yeah. It seems like you got a better view behind you than you had before. <laughs> My desk used to face the other oh, way. Oh, okay. So I get it. You would see, I get it. It you, looks like you're you in a Zen that. freaking garden here. I mean, I you know I'm waiting for the <laughs> sand rakers to come out. And Dwight Silverman's also here, old friend, dear old friend from the Houston Chronicle. He's now in charge of the Tech Burger, which is the Chronicle's kind of uh, tech. Uh, what do they call that? There's a word for it. Oh, vertical. they call it vertical it's in the business, vertical. which I hate that word. Yeah. But yes, that's what it is. And um, soon I'll be starting a newsletter called Release Notes. Oh, and nice. uh, I'm really excited about that. Uh, you can even sign up for it now. It's at HoustonChronicle.com slash Release Notes. And uh, we'll be starting up in a couple of weeks. Nice. And the woman who shares my fetish for handbags, Christina Warren, film girl is here. She's senior cloud advocate at Microsoft and I only say that because I can see at least ten bags behind you right now. Yeah, <laughs> completely, <laughs> completely. You can, you can, everyone can see like what do I like? Like you see like a Sonos in the back. I like the I Sonos. Sonos. I saw that. See, I saw that. Yeah, you see like like handbags, various yeah. other electronic yeah. stuff. Like you know, I'm messy, but you can see what are the things that make up my personality. Well, it's it's all of this. I love that. That's that's it's like um, I spy with my little eye. I can play a game with Christina's <laughs> office. <laughs> Uh, no, I love it. So it's it's great to have all three of you on. Uh, all three of you, dear friends. Big story of the week, Johnny I. But before I get to that, I want to note that this is the 12th anniversary of the release of the first iPhone. Yeah. January, yeah. Uh, June 29th, 19, uh, 2007. Let me get my numbers right. June, June 29th, 2007, 12 years ago. Uh, the iPhone hit the stores. I remember. Did, did you? Any of you wait in line or do anything to get? To, oh get, yeah. What'd you do? I was Jason? in line for out. I was in line for uh, like five or six hours. As Me too. Fact, it was just about this time on that day. I, I kid you not. I remember it being like between five thirty and six when finally <sighs> um, the first person got one, and I think I was like twelfth or something in line. Wow. Uh, yeah. I wasn't going to go to the city to the Apple store, which is where you know the faithful went. Uh, but I knew the line would be, I knew the line had started three days earlier, basically. So I went to our AT&T store here, hoping they would have enough units 
And I was like seventh or eighth in line. The people, the guys in front of me had come all the way up from Google, from Mountain View, two hours south of us, because for the same reason, so they came to the Petaluma AT&T store. And we were, we were talking. He said, yeah, I've just I've pulled three all-nighters getting Google Reader ready for the iPhone. Wow. That was a wasted effort. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in retrospect. I, uh, I, I was still in college, and so I did not have the money for an oh. iPhone. It was one of those things. I also was a T-Mobile customer. I really wanted one, but I was like, yeah, no, this, you would this have, is like, you would this have is had my to, rent. You would have had to move to <laughs> AT&T because they had an exclusive on it. Exactly. And not only that, yeah. but then it was it was like $700 or something. No, and no, it was expensive. Walt Mossberg tweeted, the reason I know this, he tweeted, oh yeah, my first review uh, of the iPhone, this is his 2007 review, is still up on the web at allthingsd.com. Uh, he noted it was a very expensive four hundred ninety nine dollars. Okay, so it was five hundred dollars. Regardless, yeah. that was that was five hundred more than I than I had. Um, no, it's still expensive, but a lot less than a modern iPhone. It's half what a modern iPhone is. Oh, totally. I mean, though though to be fair, you were still in a contract. Like it wasn't subsidized. Yes. Like in subsequent years, they yeah. would sell it for one ninety nine or two ninety nine, right. and it was subsidized. In that case, it was not subsidized, but you still had a contract. It's fascinating to read uh, Walt's review because on the one hand, Walt was smart enough to realize this was very important. He said the iPhone, the headline is the iPhone is a breakthrough handheld computer. He understood right away. This isn't a phone particularly. Uh, this is this is a computer. Uh, he says the phone's minimum price is a hefty four ninety nine, but people are already three days before the phone comes out lining up outside Apple stores to, for when they go on sale Friday evening. One of the, he, he said, it's not a great phone. Again, uh, the beginning of the not such great phones. So I think it's funny that he talks about how thin it is and how big the screen. It has right. the largest and highest resolution screen of any smartphone we've seen and the most internal memory by far. Anybody remember how much internal? Uh, it, was, it was it was four or eight. It, like, yeah. they would do both. Like, and then they end, ended up dropping the four gigabyte uh, model because they dropped yeah. the price within like 60 days. And there was a big kerfuffle over that, but they dropped the price really soon and they got rid of the four gigabyte option. And then they added that spring before the 3G an eight gigabyte uh, or a 16 gigabyte option, if I remember correctly. That's right. So it came in for 499, you got four gigabytes of storage. <laughs> See, okay, so I was right. It was $600 for the eight gigabyte. 600 for the, the one you one. wanted. That's right. I yeah. think exactly. it was 700 no, so the tax right. and stuff. Yeah. yeah, no, this is making sense. And I was like, wait, was I that off on price? Yeah, no. Um, also, no, no support for 3G. It was edge only right. on the AT&T right. network, which meant it was pig slow. It didn't have cut and paste. And most importantly, it didn't have an app store. I remember when Steve announced it, he said, oh, you don't need, all you, you need know, is the web. Yeah, it was on 2G, and all you needed was the web, yeah. which was just made it painfully, <laughs> really painful. I remember going to a meeting of some developers here in Houston where someone had been to uh, a session at Apple where they had taught uh, him how to program these web apps. And he was explaining this to them, and they all said, but it's 2G. But it's 2G, <laughs> and we will. And it was, you know, the the devs knew, you know, what was coming, and that it was going to be uh, the kind of things they had they were going to have to do in order to make it even work. Did you have to wait in line uh, to get it, uh, Dwight? Or um, I did not get one right away. I waited till the 3G uh, uh, S smart, um, that, or, or the 3G. But the one thing that I did do is I went and interviewed all these people in line, even in Houston. And if I remember right, it was raining that night here. Oh, wow. And so they were out in with umbrellas and in tents. And of course, being um, being Houston, it was really hot and rainy. So it was like a sauna. And uh, I thought these people were crazy. Reading again from Walt's review, the phone is simply beautiful. It's thinner. Can you get me uh, my phone? Is somebody there to, to go? Oh, yeah, I've got one here too. Yeah, my Come phone's on. in the uh, back cupboard there uh, in my uh, museum. The iPhone is simply beautiful. It's thinner than the skinny Samsung Blackjack, yet almost its entire surface is covered by a huge, vivid three-and-a-half-inch display. <laughs> But at the time, that and yeah. the uh, the fact that it was capacitive, I mean, that was so yeah. huge. Like I remember going and, uh, and yeah. playing with it and being like, you know, looking down at my at my trio and being like, I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> my last There's like two things I remember from that first week or first few weeks with the iPhone because it was so slow. 
the typing was a nightmare because three on that three and a half inch screen, you know, it was just tough. But I remember going into a Home Depot and I had to buy like this part and something was like it was like a plumbing or electric something at the house was like messed up and i go and i forgot to look up whatever the sort of the size of something and i was there and i was like oh shoot i forgot to do that and then i was like oh hang on wait on the iphone i can just look this on on the web Amazing. and it took forever it probably took five minutes yeah, but to load still but i looked up which part i needed and i was like oh Oh, like I was able to do this because before <laughs> you try to do that on a trio or one of these Windows mobile devices at the time. And it was just brutal trying to look up a web page on those devices. And eventually you just it wouldn't load or parts of it would fail and you would just be like, forget it. Uh, you know, whatever. Uh, in this case, I would have just gone back home and figured out what I needed. So I remembered that. And then I was still a little unconvinced. You know, I remember my review at the time was was kind of like, uh, you know, still even handed, like clear, clearly this was the future of phones. But I couldn't really advise anybody to go out and buy it right that moment. Right. Because most people were paying 100 to 200 bucks for a phone on contract at that point versus having to pay. Yeah. You really couldn't recommend anybody get the four gig. You're like, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to just get the eight, four you know, gigs. So four what gigs. I <laughs> Or not, but yeah. no apps. You but didn't I, have to worry about putting. Yeah, apps but the on, operating so. system True. must have taken more than half the storage. It did. It took a bunch. Right. If you're going to take any photos or do video or anything, or, or use um, it as an iPod, I, which right, which a lot of people right. use it as an iPod, right? right? So Walt exactly. Walt said in our tests, we were able to get one thousand. How many songs? More than a thousand songs on there. So uh, you know, it's the size. That's remember five gig iPod was a uh, thousand songs in your pocket the original ipod so. i had an ipod nano at the time that was like eight gigs right well, that's so the it was thing like, yeah that yeah. was that little tiny thing was eight gigs and i was like ooh, i don't want to take that carry this and the iphone both but i remember where where i really became a believer was i want to say this was like a month into testing it a month or two my daughter was only um she was three at the time and um, when I set the phone down and I'd been taking some pictures with it and I had been showing her the pictures and that kind of thing. And I was like, Oh, you know, that picture that we took and she picked up the phone, swiped to unlock, oh, tapped she knew the photos, already and started flipping through. And I was like, Holy crap. <laughs> like this, the three-year-old has already figured yeah. out how to use this thing. Like this is incredible. Cause you know, how it was back then if you were trying to get, I remember trying to teach, um, you know, people how to just get to the phone app to make a call on a windows phone or a trio or something like that. They're like, look, I know I can get my messages on this, but how do I make a phone call? You know? And, and people would, would just, um, freak out at figuring out how to do the simplest things. And, uh, you know, this, when this thing was that easy to use, I was like, okay, yeah, this is, uh, this is something different and this is going to be pretty, uh, pretty special. Walt said the, uh, the eight gig model held 1,300 songs, a dozen videos and get this over 100 photos. I took a hundred <laughs> photos yesterday <laughs> <laughs> and over a hundred emails, including some attachments. This is not the original iPhone. This is the 3GS, but it's the same size and form yeah. factor. Com put yeah. it next to a uh, <gasps> Samsung's Galaxy Note uh, 10, and you can see how far we've come. And yet, this is so important, this phone. This is really, mm -hmm. if you look back now, I think Walt undersold how important this phone was going to be. And he saw, I think, the importance of it. But this was the, this was the beginning of carrying a supercomputer in your pocket, having a full... 24 7 access to the internet always on always connected that is a life changer and we've seen that in the 12 years intervening uh i think our lives have changed 100 percent oh without a doubt i mean no, i think no that it's, it's it's funny sometimes people think that you're being hyperbolic and i remember the 10th anniversary i wrote something about how like it it changed like that you can't make any you know uh that it's it's been the one of the most important technological you know advances in our lifetime and I think that's absolutely true. I mean, you could maybe say, you know, the microcomputer or whatever is the only thing that might have the same amount uh, of of impact. Because when we think about what our lives were like 12 years ago and what they are now, they're so different. And the primary driver and why they're different is is the phone. Yeah, and, we talk about Twitter yeah. and Facebook, but without the phone, Twitter and Facebook aren't as powerful. Yeah, right. I mean, they might exist, when, when but the, they wouldn't be very important. 
When the history of the smartphone is written, all those other devices, the Trio and the BlackBerry, um, the, all the various you know Windows um, mobile devices, those will all be preludes. They will all be proto yeah. Yeah, yeah. devices to yeah. when it really happened when the smartphone, when the iPhone. I think arrived. it's also important because we are now in the midst of new technologies. I don't know if there'll be a technology, if there is a technology as important as the iPhone in our midst today, but we do see things like VR and augmented reality, and it's very primitive, very simple, very unusable. It's important to remember, so was the iPhone. Even when it first came yeah. out. I is this it? No. But it accelerated quickly. I mean, it a got lot to of the iPhones, point. But not the right one. It did. <laughs> it, it got to the point within, I'd say, the second generation where it actually was usable by most people. And the, and certainly the, having 3G helped it a lot. I mean, it, it made a leap very quickly. I yes. had a blackjack at the time yes. that it came out. And I loved my blackjack until... I saw uh, people using the original iPhone, and even though it was slow, I, you know, I had to have one when I could afford it, and, and I did. And I think a lot of people were like that. It it made the leap, I'd say, within two years to being an essential device. And very famously, Google was already developing its first Android phone, saw the iPhone, and said, back to the drawing board. They threw everything yeah. out. Right. Yep. They said we're no longer going to be taking on Windows Mobile and BlackBerry, and instead yep. this is going to be what we go after. Which you know is obviously the right move. Um, a little bit complicated by the fact that Eric Schmidt was on the Apple board, but you know that aside, I mean that's <laughs> which, definitely the right. Which, by the, right the way, I got to point out, Steve Jobs never forgave him. He said Eric stole oh, everything. No. There it is. That's the old. That's our yep. old baby. Oh, there you go. Right. Let me see if I was rich enough. Yes, I got an eight gig. <sighs> <laughs> By the way, every once in a while we fire this up. I think the last time Christina was on the 10th anniversary and it still works. Still got all my phone numbers on there and my old songs. <laughs> I was apparently very much into Britney Spears at the time. <laughs> hey, what, what can I say? I mean, whatever. Hey. <laughs> I mean, whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Full disclosure. Yeah. And if you have an Android phone now, and I do, and I think there's some real, I mean, I love my Samsung. Uh, you still owe it to Apple. Those these black slabs of glass sure. wouldn't exist without Apple. And and by the way, without Steve Jobs, who I mean, we've all read now the stories of that first demo in January of 2007, where that thing barely worked, uh, but yeah. he sold it. Man, he made it the thing you had to have. And uh, and that relationship with the carriers too. That that one thing that gets overlooked is, mm -hmm. you know, he had he had the mojo to go in there and change the relationship between phone makers and carriers because the carriers really dominated how phones were designed and built back then, and they strong armed all of the, uh, you know, all, all of the phone makers into making the phones that they wanted, and they did most of the marketing, and they did most of the. Um, uh, again, the, the 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 design and the integration of the way the phones were made, they did a lot of those decisions. And Steve Jobs went in and said, "No, we think we can handle this better. You know, look, we we have a lot of loyal users who are going to be interested in this device, and uh, we we think we can handle that. And if you want to be part of it, then um, you know, we'll give you an exclusive." And you'll get, be the one to uh, to have this device because look, it's going to be great, and you want to be part of it. And that did forever change the the shift the balance of power and put uh, phone makers back in charge, and and for the better, right? Because not only Apple, but um, a lot of others came on HTC, Samsung, and others quickly. LG at the time, even though you know since they've had their their challenges. Um, but they came in and followed up on what the iPhone did and innovated that then a lot of the features they worked on eventually came into iPhone uh, as well. And it really unleashed this um, this innovation, this wave of innovation that wouldn't have happened unless the, it was decoupled from the carriers in the way that it was. I, I don't yeah, think... You, go ahead. You want, you want to know something? They're still imitating... I know. I yeah. know this is the... This is the LG V50 ThinkQ, the Sprint 5G phone. Yeah. This, yep. so what does this look like? This looks like... <laughs> a big iPhone. <laughs> like a big iPhone. What the hell? This even has the notch. They're even imitating the notch. Yeah, the notch is in identical. Fact, in fact, uh, people will see notch. this on my desk and say, oh, you got a new iPhone. Yeah. And I have to say, no, yeah. I didn't. But to be yeah. fair, there's not a whole lot you could do. I mean, this form factor is, is that way because that's... The way it is, got to be a black slab of glass, got to be edge to edge. I mean, how many, 
How many? But that notch. You're not going to make it round. You're not going to make it a pyramid. Oh, the notch. That notch that everybody made fun of when it came out. Yeah, I know. But you know what? The Samsung doesn't have a notch. It has a cutout. And I have the OnePlus uh, uh, 7 Pro now, which has, instead of, it's a, actually, it's it's a perfect black slab. (laughs) And the the front-facing camera comes rising out of the top of it, (laughs) which is pretty (laughs) hysterical. So everybody's not slavishly uh, copying Apple. They did drop the headphone jack on a number of those phones, which I guess is a slavish copy. But still, you hold this in your hand, you realize how important it was. It's hard to believe. I don't think we knew when Steve announced this that he was sick, but he died only four and a half years later. Yeah. He was already on uh, uh, deathly ill. Uh, This was his really, this and the iPad were his last great creations. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to his credit, I don't think this exists without, uh, Steve jobs and one other guy, Johnny Ive. And that takes us to our yeah. second story because it was this week. We learned that Johnny Ive, who really has only been half there anyway, apparently his only according to Mark Gurman only goes in two days a week anyway, has finally admitted he is leaving Apple. And that really is the, the end of the era, I think, um, the uh, I think the best quote comes from John Gruber, uh, who says, let me see if I can, it's right at the end of his article. I don't worry that Apple is in trouble yeah. because Johnny Ive is leaving. I worry that Apple's in trouble because he's not being replaced. I don't know who you'd replace him with, but what's happening is the design team, Evans Hankey, Vice President of Industrial Design, and Alan Dye, Vice President of Human Interface Design, are going to report to Apple's COO, Jeff Williams, in a way, this feels like the end of the design era at Apple. Yeah, Gruber's point, and which I think is a good one, is just that it, nobody's going to replace Johnny Ive, right? Like you, 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 with the iPhone, right? That he he designed something that's going to have impact for decades after he's gone, very likely, if not longer. Um, but the position, chief design officer, because of Apple being such a design centric company. Uh, that is critical. And to not have that, I think is, and that is what, you know, Gruber said, and I think he said it best because that is critical. And for them not to do that, not even to try to replace them, not to, whether it's uh, if you are going to move somebody up internal or you're going to go find somebody at another brand or bring somebody up from the outside the way they did with um, Angela Aarons when they wanted to take the, um, uh, the retail stores to the next level, you know, not doing that, uh, not committing to that is, is what is questionable. And it's, it's what worries people. Cause there has been uh, beyond this year where there have been a, a really pretty interesting and exciting wave of, um, some new products. Uh, they have their, their design, um, shops have, been called into question the last few years is, and their commitment is, to design in the same way. Was Johnny Ive without Steve Jobs like uh say Paul Lennon, Paul McCartney without John Lennon? Was that was it somewhat I, I mean the know. two of them together were a synergy that has rarely or if ever been seen. No, I mean I think you're exactly correct. I mean they were obviously I think some of the best industrial design work and some of the best, you know, consumer electronic work was done uh because of the two of them and because Johnny Ive is, is, and he's, he's so young, he's like 52, which just makes me feel completely inadequate. Um, he's done a lot. <laughs> yeah, he has, yes. I'm saying. Like he's done He so started, much. what was yeah. his first design at Apple? Was it the, the Bondi Blue uh, iMac? The iMac. No, yeah, that. first no, iMac. No, 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 It was the message. Well, his made. first it was famous his one, his most famous well, one. Well, his, his most famous one. But if you look back and look at that second Newton, that, that message mate, it looks a whole lot like the Bondi ah, Blue iMac. He it was kind of clear. The, that was yep. the one that was sold mostly for for education, right? Yeah. And he also did uh, the 20th anniversary. Um, uh, Mac oh yeah, Mac. we have that. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. I forgot. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. uh, and and then Jobs came back. He was going to leave, and and um, uh, John uh, Rubenstein and uh, and Jobs were able to convince him to stay. But um, no, I mean, I think that you're that the two of them together. You're right. Like they had this sort of synergy. But I don't know if it's fair to say that like when Steve passed that you know, he wasn't able to to do the right things. I always got this sense from reading, you know, the various profiles of him in places like the New Yorker and Financial Times and things like that, that his personal interests kind of shifted. Like he was all in on the watch. I think the watch was, was he was all in on. And that was supposed to be, 
you know, and it was very much marketed in the beginning as a piece of jewelry and as a fashion kind of, you know, timepiece. And and that didn't work. And so they had to pivot to health, which obviously did. Um, but but when you pivot, when you make that pivot, the the design and the things that go into that kind of design become a little bit less important, uh, I think you could argue. And then, you know, he got really interested in doing the the um, Apple Park the spaceship. Yeah, yeah. Apple Park. And so I don't know. I mean, I don't know the guy, but it, it wouldn't seem un, unfair to say, OK, you've been at this job for 27 years and your own personal interests and the things you like. And if you look at his other uh, collaborations that he've done, he's done with his friend Mark Newsom, um, you know, maybe he has just like a different aesthetic and different things he's interested in. And maybe that was related to Steve Dine. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. But I don't. There was feel like there was criticism of him, though, that it was design over function. Sure. Yeah, I agree with that. But but I mean, I think you could also say that Steve Jobs wasn't without history on that too. I mean, look at the the cube, right? The G four cube yeah. is is. I love that uh, though. I, Man, was that a great it's computer? A great, and, it, and it's a great design. It didn't work. It, it cracked. It got, was, but not, not only that, but I had one. We had one at my high school that like caught on fire. Like, <laughs> like it was. Terrible. But it sure looked and good. And you know right. what? The Mac Pro twenty thirteen Mac Pro sure looked good. Crappy uh, product. And that's a Johnny Ive as well. Here's the e-mate, not the message mate. This is this is what you were talking about, the e-mate yes. 3000. So that was the first Johnny Ive. And yeah, you definitely see the uh, iMac, yeah. Bondi iMac in that. Mm -hmm. He did this really crazy. We, I've just learned that we got rid of our, we had a 20, 20th century, uh, 20th anniversary uh, Mac. But when we uh, moved studios, we got rid of a lot of stuff. I hope somebody, I hope it went to a good home. Probably Alex Gumpel uh, got it. <laughs> There's the cube. <laughs> I loved my cube, but you're right. It was a, it wasn't a smart design. You know what what surprised me when the announcement came that Johnny was leaving was almost immediately there was as as you said, Leo, this this criticism mm -hmm. uh, of Johnny Ives' designs that essentially they have driven the entire industry to uh, devices that aren't repairable, that can't be, mo that aren't modular. You're mice you that, can't charge while you're using. Uh, <laughs> right, right, right. And it is, it you know, to a certain extent, I think they're right. But I think that the, if you look at the things that were happening about the time of the iPhone and around the time of the iPad, that was already in, in play. I think yeah. there were a lot of things coming at the time. Things were getting thinner. Things were getting smaller. And and I think I just took it, you know, to its natural progression. I'm not sure that he deserves all the criticism that he's got. Maybe not. That. Although uh, Gruber does point out that if you hadn't had the Apple design team insisting on thinner and thinner laptops, you probably wouldn't have the butterfly keyboard. Apple wouldn't be so dug in on this keyboard that clearly <laughs> is a failure and that hurt Apple, honestly. Oh yeah, no, that's particularly since it. particularly since other uh, makers of laptops and other devices have made them small, but haven't made the same kind of sacrifices. Right. You could buy some really nice Windows machines that have a lot more uh, connectivity types that are very thin and have an excellent keyboard. You know, so it's not it, Apple doesn't necessarily they've driven things in a diff in a certain direction but a lot of people have improved on what Apple did. Christina, do you think that it will be th that this will be an opportunity for Apple to abandon some of those bad design decisions like the keyboard? I mean, I hope so. I mean, I think the big question is going to be what what takes control of design at Apple because I think that's that's kind of John Gruber's point and I agree with it which is that it is sort of disconcerting that there isn't um, kind of a figurehead who is now at the company who is making those design decisions. Um you know, I think you could be optimistic and say this might be an opportunity. There might have been, might be plenty of people at that company who have had really good ideas, but haven't had the opportunity to express them and to execute them because you had one of the greatest industrial designers of all time working there. So how would how would anybody else get a chance to to even make any sorts of, of changes or or to put their own vision out there? So I think it kind of depends, right? Like, I, but but definitely, I think this is an opportunity to say we don't have to be. I guess maybe beholden to these decisions, we can make other decisions. I would uh, hope so. But obviously, if there is a change to the keyboard design within the next two years, in all likelihood, that design was was led by Johnny Ives' team, right? Like this, these things yeah. don't work in a vacuum. These decisions yeah. are made far in advance. So it'll be know, years before we don't see Johnny's imprint. Right, and then sure. even then, 
you know, he's forming his own company and, and Apple is going to be one of his, you know, yeah. exclusive clients. I now, don't how buy that. Apple, like, I don't <laughs> yeah. think, well, yeah. it might, might, yeah. be, might be a, an advisory thing. I don't know, but I'm just saying you could, you could understand that if, if it got to it, if they didn't have, you know, they wanted somebody to kind of do a general design and then they would, you know, hone in on it. That could be still somebody that they want to go to. You never know. Yeah. So, so I'll play well, devil's advocate on this a little bit. Um, sorry, Dwight, just I'll make this quick. Um, I'll play devil's advocate just a little and say one of the reasons, you know, you have to ask why would Apple do this? Tim Cook knows it's a design driven company. You know, obviously, so do the other people at the company, Phil Schiller and others. Why would they make this change? And from their perspective, it could be that, you know, design has taken them having a design chief be able to have to be able to overrule some of these other sort of functional decisions to to the point you made earlier leo may have not been may have not have served apple real well uh in the last yeah. few years and this may be an acknowledgement of that and a fact that design you know is still going to be important to them but that they're going to follow users um, and and user needs a little bit more and um, be less beholden to uh, sort of an aesthetic decision yeah. by design that leads to the touch bar, that leads to um, a somewhat compromised first design of the Apple Watch, that leads to um, the challenges with the, you know, even with the headphone jack and with other things. And so perhaps that that pragmatic design will um, will be part of what they're going for um, with this move, if we're trying to read the tea leaves and understand yeah, no, why point. they might have done this. No, that's a good point. I mean, actually, because, you know, when they gave Johnny the figurehead title of, you know, chief design officer and had everybody report to him, it was kind of officially stating what had already been, at least from what I understand how Apple works, they're very secretive, but, but based on things that have been written, was that, you know, they the, the Johnny's design team operated in their own silo and were kind of separate from everything else. But when you actually give him that, you know, spot on like the, the, the reporting structure, that makes that very clear. This could be, like Jason's saying, maybe a potential reset of saying, okay, you still do your own thing and what you do is still leading the company, but this is no longer going to be separate from the rest of the work that's being done. So that if we do have concerns, maybe in some other where areas, that's going to be taken into account as well. That, that that's that's a that's a pretty good theory, Jason. It's funny because well, also go ahead. Well, go also ahead. one thing I think you want to think about is that they haven't said they're not going to replace him. They haven't said they're not going to have a chief design officer. They just haven't yet. Oh, so and this might could, be a temporary structure, and at some this point. might be a temporary structure where they look at these at the two guys who are going to be reporting to the COO. One of them, one or either of them, could be a candidate for it, and they may be looking on the outside. The fact that they haven't done it now doesn't mean they won't do it later. I feel like Apple made him. So there's two ways to look at this. So on the one hand, you could say, "Oh my God, John and Paul have left the group. We're stuck with Ringo." Uh, uh, and and without the the two most important people, I think in in personal technology over the last thirty or forty years, Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive, that's that doesn't bode well. You're you're not going to see another thing like this iPhone. It's not that you know no. who's who's going to make that next thing. On the other hand, you could say there was a big mistake made by Apple a few years ago because they put Johnny not only in charge of industrial design, but in charge of all user interface and software design. And at that, that was actually the point where iOS went way south with iOS 8, which was horrifically poorly designed. And I think you could make the case that Johnny Ive running software was a big mistake on Apple's part. So I think there's two... There's two point of views. I'm not sure which I which I hold, and I think I'm. I think you're right, Dwight. It could very well be. I mean, it can't be. There's only one Johnny Ive in the world, or, or no. There I mean, be? there there aren't going to be many, right? But it doesn't mean that we won't see it again. It, it it remains to be seen if Apple will be the company that has that, or if it's another one. I mean, it's interesting. Robert Brunner was the guy who hired Johnny Ive at Apple, and he was the Apple um, and he the lead Apple designer before that, and. Uh, he uh, went on to uh, to be the lead uh, designer for uh, Beats by Dre, um, and and is very talented in his own right. But I talked with him a number of years ago at a Beats event, and he said, and and in very good naturedly, I have to say, like it was in no way like with any bit of bitterness at all. He was like, I hired Johnny Ive is going to be on my tombstone. Like this is the guy that created the power book that created beats like that is in his own right, like a very, very successful and amazingly talented yeah. industrial designer. But 
yeah, he knows. I mean, and again, like it was completely good natured about it. It was no bitterness at all. But just like, yeah, the fact that I hired Johnny Ive is going to be, you know, uh, what I'm best <laughs> and that known power, for. That power book design was bananas for the time. Like that thing was mind blowing. John yeah, Dvorak called it a toilet seat. Oh my seat. gosh. <laughs> well, no, I not that the one. Dark. The black one. Oh, remember, the black Remember one? the black? The Darth Vader when every thing. Yeah, the original power book was so sweet. Um, it was uh, it was at the time thin and, you know, all the laptops were beige. Right. And they made this like black, um, very stealth looking thing. Remember it pretty soon after the first like Mission Impossible. This is, this movie, is it. The it, power it, book G3s is yeah. this what you're talking about. Yeah, there that you is go. actually well, given that era. Pretty impressive. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah it is very sexy. Yeah. yeah, that was the one that Carrie uses in um, Sex in the City. Aha. <laughs> Thank you for that. I remembered it from Mission reference. Impossible. <laughs> in Mission Impossible, he's like hanging up from upside down from the ceiling, you know, and he's using this, and it's like a power book, and it's this, and people are like, "How much did Apple pay to put that in there?" And it wasn't that; it was that the movie, you know, uh, companies wanted to look just like as super cutting edge as possible and yeah. futuristic, right? This so was, they chose that. This to Apple aficionados will always be, always be known as the Pismo. This was the Pismo, uh, which yeah, is a Pismo, kind of clam, I think, right? Yeah, Pismo. And then they also had like the Wall Street, which was from the same series, yeah. but same design uh, thing that had a little bit extra features. That laptop was fantastic. It was a rare Apple laptop that had um, total expandability. You could take out the CD-ROM drive and put in, you could take out the CD-ROM drive and you could put in another battery or you could put in another hard drive. It had FireWire. It had, you know, PC um, MCIA slots. Like that thing was an amazing was laptop. Yeah, look up 1993 compact laptop at the time, and look what it was compared to. Right, oh, yes, like it was yes. just. I remember that. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I mean, they were these big, giant, you know, huge, thick, um, uh, you know, beige, just chunky things that looked as big as a briefcase. They, they were an inch and a half thick. They were massive. Is and that heavy? Is that the Armada? Is that the one we're talking about? Let's see what. You're... Well, that's but, uh, this the, is more the, recent. The compact Armada. Was a uh, that was two thousands. Let's go back yeah. to uh, to oh yeah, that was a power book knockoff, right? At yeah. the time, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, was it one? Was it like this? The, this is nineteen eighty eight. So this these really were crappy. Maybe this is it. The LTE Elite. This is nineteen eighty nine. Uh, this is getting closer. <laughs> yeah. about what? Look at the yeah. trackball on the side on the screen. Nice place. So I had oh, yeah. one of those. You know what? That was great for playing Wolf and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah. your hand was right where the screen was, and so if you were rolling around and firing, the buttons were on the back side of the of the screen. So if you were rolling around playing a first person shooter, it was great. Wow. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, Apple was. This is this cool. is, and the, the funny thing is, Apple's really been riding on this ever since i mean i think you could absolutely say that the language the way we think of apple was very much influenced by how it looked mm -hmm. and johnny is the man behind it so i wonder i mean is it going to be what happened to the Bauhaus after uh mr house left i don't know <laughs> uh it, it may it isn't going to be the same it'll be a different design a different language and maybe it'll even be a different company as a result i wonder uh it these these two jobs and Ives, uh, Ive were really um, uh, one of a kind. It's not like he's dead, but I don't think he's honestly. When Apple says, "Oh yeah, we're, we'll work with them in the future," no, no, no. <laughs> he's gonna it's be like, doing. It's like leaving to spend more time with your family, yeah, right? Like it's, it's right, one right. Of those, you can't, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. yeah. No, he's gonna be designing toilet seats or rocket ships or something. He is not. He's he's pretty done. Air. Very by the way, the last that. Johnny Ive design was the AirPods. Yeah, which, um, you know, I mean, a lot of people have have criticized them, said, oh, it's just the same thing as as the earpods. But no, I mean, AirPods, for all the jokes people made, I loved them the minute I tried them at the Apple event. I was like, okay, this might look silly, but this actually is pretty brilliant. Well, Heiner's wearing hilarious. them right now, but... <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I would wear them right now if I wasn't worried about having weird, like, Bluetooth conflict with my um, plugged-in mic. But um, I, uh, I mean... You see them everywhere. It's so funny. Uh, when I left New York City for Seattle, they were just starting. It had been about six, seven months after they'd been released. You were just starting to see them all over New York City. And when I came back a couple months later, they were everywhere. And I always joke that Seattle's like six months behind New York. But um, and, and it's true. And you know, about six months after they infiltrated New York City, they were everywhere, everywhere. in Seattle. So but funny. now I go all over the world and 
they are everywhere. I did it's not. We lo we mocked them so much when they came out and how it looked coming out of your yeah, ear and how dopey it was. And Jason's wearing them right now, so I'm uh -huh. I'm going to hold back a little bit, but <laughs> don't hold back. I, I mock them as bad as anybody. Yeah, but but you They're know what? Dopey you see, until everybody wears. Them. You see, you see them everywhere yeah. now. You see right. them all the yeah. time at the gym. It's all anybody's wearing. And honestly. I think they're crap. They don't sound good. We now know they're bad for your hearing. A good article in Medium by Angela Lashbrook. She writes about science in Medium. She says because they don't do noise isolation, she's quoting a professor of uh, otolaryngology at uh, Case Western, people turn up the sound louder because the outside noise is getting in. And they, she says, I'm seeing a lot of younger people in their 20s coming in with ringing in their ears Related to this all-day earbud use, it's noise trauma. So not only I, I, are they bad for you, not only do they look dumb, they don't sound as good as a, a dozen cheaper headphones, and they're bad for you. <laughs> yeah, but they're convenient, I, I, and they pair instantly, <laughs> and they're just so easy. Like, I, I've had better, better, you know, um, headphones than, than, than ear pods, but I don't have anything as convenient. There are lot, now there are lots copying them with the box that has the battery in it. Definitely. And, they, and most of them, if you look seal. at the size of the buds, don't have a, like, they hurt. Like, or if you have oh, small okay. ears, they don't work well. I don't okay. know. I don't, I haven't found any that, I mean, and, and to be clear though, plenty of people, ear pods, air pods don't work in their ears. And so yeah. if, if you're one of those people, then you're screwed. But yeah, I mean, so I, I, I do a, look forward to the, to the noise canceling ones that we know will eventually come out probably for twice the money. So I wrote a story about this because I can never wear these things. They don't, they fall out of my ears um, until um, I wrote a story about this on CNET a couple, uh, maybe a month ago about how the only way that I could oh, use Oh, you put them, a little, uh, little rubber silicone uh, curvy yeah. thing in there. Yeah. Interesting. And that so that looks like an IUD this. for your ear. It does. Yeah, it the does. sound, <laughs> but it turns it into sound isolating. So by this, ah. you don't have to turn them up as loud and the bass is much, much better. Of course. Uh, and it stays in your ear. It's an in-ear uh, monitor, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. And yeah. but I have to point out that's not Apple designing that, and probably Johnny Ive would just hate it. Oh, I'm sure he would. Probably. Sure would. And what that's you honestly, if he had a flaw, <laughs> if he had a strength, it was that he was iconic. The designs he did for Apple, including the AirPods, are iconic, and and he was great because if you see an Apple product on the street, you know immediately, you know those AirPods are an Apple product. You know that iPhone is an Apple product. It's immediately. Sure. But at the same time. He was also a slave to, to, to style. And and sometimes that's not the most functional thing. Like those AirPods, I don't think are very good. Uh, they never worked for me until until I got that $15 uh, silicone piece that yes, slips on but Jason, and holds them in your ears. But ruins the line of the AirPods. <laughs> <laughs> You've destroyed it's in his ear, you everything I've created, Jason. J Jason, what's the brand of that? Because I want one of those. <laughs> it's called it's called Aha Style. If you go to CNET, I just uh -huh. there's an I article even that, hate the yeah. name Aha Style. <laughs> <laughs> even the Leo, name is painful Leo, to me. It's so funny when uh when I interviewed uh, Johnny Ive, um, and I interviewed him and Anna Winter at the same time, so it was utterly terrifying. Um, no and, kidding. And they were both very nice, but uh, I, I, I tried to joke with Johnny before the interview started to kind of break the ice. And I was like, can you say aluminum for me? And, and, and he did to his credit, but he was very clearly like he, he didn't want to meme. Oh, and so I'm geez. sorry that I made you meme Johnny, but like <laughs> I, I had to, I was like, I'm never going to have this opportunity again. I have to hear him say aluminum um, <laughs> because it's such an iconic part of Apple's product rollout videos for so long, you know, was, <laughs> these was colonials are just so tiring. <laughs> Let's take a uh, anyway. It's I think it's uh, end of an era for Apple. It'll be very interesting to see if Apple can uh, move on to the next thing. I think it's an opportunity. I do for Apple, um, and to maybe focus a little less on design and more on functionality. Uh, that would be my vote because I can't use those key that keyboard. I won't buy an Apple laptop till they fix the keyboard. Um, our show today brought to you. We got a great panel, by the way. Thank you, Christina Warren, for being here. Just. Always a pleasure to have you on, Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. Uh, the fabulous, and I'll never forget Dwight Silverman, and we were hanging out when Steve Jobs announced the uh, first iPad in 2010. That's right. That's right. Always a pleasure from the Houston Chronicle, and Jason Heiner, who uh, single-handedly got me elected president of the internet. I didn't even have to ride down a golden elevator or escalator or anything. <laughs> I thank you for that. 
uh, from Tech. Well, was of Tech. Were you the Were you a founder at Tech Republic? I was not. A lot of people seem to think that, but no, I was there. I was there early. I was there before we were making money when we were losing two million dollars a month when wow. money was cheap in the dot com boom. But um, but no, I but I I did work for Tech Republic for eighteen years, and I was editor in chief for eleven years. You're so associated um, with it that that's why I assumed. Well, you must sure. have been there at the very beginning. No longer sure. at the Tech Republic. He's now editorial director at CNET. Oh, still CBS Interactive, but that's uh, right. But he's moved to the corner office which is what really counts. <laughs> that is same that office, amazing. That's okay. Same office facing the other way. Just facing <laughs> the other way. <laughs> he was exactly. allowed to move his desk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by Calm.com. I have been a Calm premium member for a long time. If you think I'm serene, I owe it to Calm.com. It is an app, but you can also use it on the, on the uh, website. Calm is a site that brings you meditations, guided meditations. In fact, every day, the daily calm. But it also helps you sleep better. Sleep deficiency is a serious problem in our modern age because we're all stressed out. Look at these great sleep stories. I love these sleep stories. Jerome Flynn, this was one we listened to the other night, Lisa and I, giving you a tour. Jerome Flynn is the sellsword from Game of Thrones, by the way. And tonight? And he gives you a I'll tour of his sleep story New Zealand. Sacred New Zealand. Between filming Game of Thrones and my own travels, I've had the honor of visiting some remarkable oh, places. You know what? The, the nice thing about these sleep stories, the most they're beautiful, they're beautifully narrated, but honestly, if you fall asleep in the middle of it, no big deal. Here's an, here's an ASMR he's one minute. description he's one minute. of the theory of relativity. The night. Okay. These are the questions we will explore. In our special ASMR story tonight. Oh, you're going to fall right asleep. And, we'll and you know what? That's okay. You'll way. still understand the theory of relativity in your sleep. There's also music. You know, Moby's recent, uh, most recent album was released exclusively on Calm.com. Beautiful ambient sounds. Not just for sleep. I actually listen to the music while I'm working. They have great music for just kind of uh, helping you focus, helping you concentrate. Uh, and that I just love that. Here's one called Cricket Pitch. So just have this running in the background. There's master classes in many subjects, including conscious parenting, gratitude, peak performance, mindful eating, breaking bad habits, discovering happiness. There's stretching, stretching, warm up, cool down, back care, evening wind down. And then you could just have a scene. Let's, let's go to the, the mountains. And hear the wind in the pines. Calm.com. Right now, this week in tech, listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm, C A L M dot com slash twit. This is a great gift. I gave it to my uh, kids because, hey, it's stressful being a millennial, right? They need this. Calm, right? Right, Christina? Calm.com <laughs> slash twit. 40 million people use Calm to relax to calm down, to make their life better. You should too. Really lovely. Look at that. The snow is falling on the cedars. It's relaxing. It's calm. Thank you, Calm, for your support. Thank you for supporting us by going to calm.com slash twit. Uh, we were wondering when Apple, because when Apple announced the 2013 Mac Pro, it made a big deal. We're going to make it in Texas. It's going to be made in the U.S. Didn't work out so well. Uh, uh, a number of people I've talked to, including myself, the first one we got didn't work so good. We had to turn it back in, get another one. Never did work quite right. Apple has announced they are manufacturing their new Mac Pro. Actually, they haven't announced it. According to people familiar with the plans in the Wall Street Journal, the new Mac Pro will be made in China, Shanghai. Okay, mm. nothing to say about that. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, Everything else surprised. is made in China. Yeah. Why not, right? I was going to say, I mean, that those types of moves to me always seem like it's pandering um, in, in a lot like of ways. Like making it in Texas, you mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Th th those moves always seem as pandering and, and don't necessarily, I mean, it's great. Like Foxconn pretending to build a plant in Wisconsin. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then not, <laughs> and then just taking a, taking a bunch of money and then not actually doing anything, right? right? Like yeah. this stuff is all, I mean, every other aspect of what they're doing is going to be made in China. So you're paying twice in some cases, you know, to, to ship it to Texas to then assemble and do other stuff. Like it just, yeah. I don't know. It doesn't make any, it doesn't make any business sense. And 
you know, the the end user, I think, as it's obvious, hasn't really cared. So there's also I, the issue of, frankly, uh, manufacturing capabilities. They yeah, have that's, that's an, true. A, an amazing capability, which think is a lot of because Apple went to Shenzhen in 2007 to get the iPhone made. And mm -hmm. in the in the intervening years, they've just gotten better and better at this kind of manufacture. Um, so the question becomes, what happens to the manufacturing facility that was doing the Mac Pro right. uh, in Austin? Right. Is it going to be, uh, you know, are they, are they going to be building something else? Are those people uh, going to be laid off? That's a, those are some good questions I mean, or, to ask. Or were they, were they already laid off? Like, we don't know. I mean, I, I would be genuinely very Likely. curious how, how many yeah. Mac Pros have actually come off that assembly line in the last few years. Because they haven't had any updates to that product. They hadn't need year. to make any more. Nobody bought them. That's what I'm saying. So, uh, but, but but even if you assume that they had been making them um, still, like they haven't made any changes to that line. So you could have a certain amount of surplus and then you don't need any more. So, I mean, I would be curious if, if I were somebody who was in Texas and, and had access to that thing, I would want to look in and see, is this plant still operating? Dwight? And, and how long has it been going on? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, some, maybe trip, somebody at the Houston Chronicle. Trip to Dallas, Dwight. Dwight. All right. I'm making some calls. <laughs> so Apple put $100 million into tooling and equipment for that plant. And actually, it's in Austin, not Dallas. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it was run by Flex. Um, neither Flex nor Quanta, the new, the new company that will be making them in China. Although Quanta is, by the way, a Taiwanese company. Uh, yep. Are commenting on the uh, plans uh, that the Wall Street Journal is reporting on. Apple's spokesperson said, final assembly is only one part of the manufacturing process, which, by the way, tells me it's going to be in China. Uh, the, yeah. the, the, uh, adding the company's investments support 2 million American jobs. The Mac Pro is Apple's most powerful computer used by a relatively small number of professionals. So, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, remember, I don't know if you remember, but uh, in 2017... President Trump said that Tim Cook had promised him that they would bid, build three big, beautiful plants in the United States, a, a, a claim at which uh, Apple at the time refused to comment upon. And as far as I know, Apple has not built any plants in the United States. They are building bigger facilities, campuses in Seattle and uh, Austin and New York City. Um, I mean, I think the thing we have to keep in mind with this system is this is a massively cutting edge system they are using the most advanced chips in the world they're moving they're some of these chips are so advanced we've never even seen them before outside of laboratories right and so i i think that probably limited some of the um some of what they could do you know for better or worse the best chip making plants um are in china and they're run by taiwanese companies um like quanta like foxconn um, and uh, a handful of others, but they had they probably had to do this because in order to get the latest parts, they didn't want to make a bunch of parts here, ship them you know to to some part uh, another part of the world and and build them there. Like these things have to be engineered um, really well and they have to be integrated perfectly because these are cutting edge technologies that, um, are just not normal and are tough to replicate uh, in facilities that aren't doing, that aren't building these things. And manufacturing really is um, advancing to where it's trying to bring design and different parts of the business together right. Right. Uh, with manufacturing. Um, so I, my, I suspect that's why this had to be built where it's built. There, there was, I read a long thread on Reddit about the, the holes in the case and different, you know, it, I love Reddit for this. You get obsessive industrial uh, machinists in there saying, well, I think it was a cylinder. It must have been a cylinder drill or whatever. And they're, and they're talking about, but it, no matter what, there wasn't, there was no clear consensus. It was a hard thing to make that weird cheese grater case. And of yeah. course, that's very Apple. In fact, in all yeah. likelihood, they're going to build a special machine that makes those oh, cases, totally. right? Totally. Sure. Uh, according to the Wall can. Street Journal, that flex, you can stop the phone calls, uh, Dwight. According to Apple, uh, that that <laughs> campus, the uh, Flex uh, facility hasn't really been uh, making the new Mac Pro in China isn't likely to affect many workers in Texas because demand for the old model fizzled years ago. The Flex workforce yeah. had shifted to refurbishing already made computers, former Flex employees said. The Flex plant continues to make products for HP and other companies. So not a lot. So of, it was a contract operation. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. a profit deal. 
So uh, there is so much, so much for that. The, that is related, though. I wonder if Apple knows something, has, uh, because as Tim Cook has been calling President Trump frequently, I understand, trying to figure out what the trade situation with China is going to be. This could impact Apple dramatically. Yeah. Uh, and if they're putting manufacture in China, I wonder if that's a signal that maybe he heard that um, the president told Tim, don't worry, that uh, those, those we're not going to have to worry about tariffs because the Chinese are going to cave. Uh, apparently, at the G20 summit, there was some progress made with President Xi because, guess what? Huawei, it's okay again. Go, <laughs> go ahead. Get a Huawei phone. Get a Huawei it's, laptop. It's not a national security it's not, concern It turns anymore. out it's not. It was a mis So, and this is exactly what we thought would happen, but I'm, yeah. you know. So, what's happened, apparently, they're still on the entity list. This is a list that U.S. companies are not supposed to deal with with Huawei. And this was a big problem for Huawei because that meant Qualcomm couldn't sell them chips. Google couldn't give them Android updates. There was a lot of stuff that, and then, and then at that point, even ARM, although I think they retracted mm -hmm. it, but at first ARM said, well, then we Arm can't work like with we them. Can't, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was, I mean, it's a bad, it's a death sentence for any company. Completely. And, uh, but apparently it, as much as they were talking about security, it wasn't exactly security because, now, apparently, and this is a lot of money, billions of dollars in money flowing back in the United States because Huawei can now buy Qualcomm chips again and Google can now support Android again. Uh, the president, it's a, it's a weird roller coaster. The president said only on the stuff that there's not a security issue. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so I, so I, I guess he's saying, well, well, the routers and, and the maybe, 5G I stuff, I don't that's know. bad. But the other, yeah, exactly. Maybe. We don't know. We it's don't un, know. According to PC Magazine, it's unclear whether that extends to the 5G network technology Huawei is developing. Um, Google is okay. Uh, obviously, Qualcomm is okay. Intel uh, is okay. He, uh, he said that these are complex and highly scientific products created by U.S. tech companies. I wish I could do a Trump impression, but I can't. <laughs> I need Alec Baldwin. What we've done in Silicon Valley is incredible, and nobody's been able to compete with it, and I've agreed to allow them to continue to sell that product to Huawei. The ban actually hadn't taken effect. Remember, they gave it a three-month uh, halt, a pause, but it was affecting the development of future products. Remember, Huawei pulled back their Matebook. They were going to release a new laptop. Huawei said, well, we're working on our own OS. We've got new suppliers. Um, so I don't, it's all, it's all up in the air. The, the bottom line is that the U.S. and China are so closely interlinked. That's like the, the economies problem. of the yes. U.S. and China are so mm -hmm. closely interlinked that it's really not that possible for us to have a trade war without really shooting ourselves in the foot. And one of the things that's most troublesome about sort of some of the stuff now, you know, walking back some of the tech stuff, because it's it's terrible PR, um, is that, you know, people that maybe it's not as terrible PR for like farmers who, you know, were selling a lot of soybeans, a lot of other things to China. And now, you know, um, China cut some of that off, uh, a lot of that off in retaliation. And then they got, you know, handouts from the government essentially to help um, compensate for that, to help weather sort of the storm. Um, you know, in, in the end, it just doesn't leave a very good taste in your mouth when you realize like some of the people who, it, you know, where these things aren't a PR disaster, get hurt and bear the brunt of this. And, you know, whereas others don't, right? And so, in the end, the, the the China trade thing is going to get worked out because it behooves both parties to do it. it has um, to be our economies are just too yeah. interlinked to, yeah. to not do it. <sighs> but who's to say that tomorrow Trump won't say, oh, no, wait, you can't sell to Huawei anymore. We still right. have a lot yeah. of issues. You know, that could happen tomorrow. Sure. He's so mercurial yep. and so unpredictable. Well, and you got the feeling that they, like, decided this. They were having lunch. President Xi gave him a, some of his sandwich. And he said, okay, yeah. we'll let you have Huawei. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it was he, feels like that. It feels like, oh, he's a nice really guy. Does. I don't want to do that. It really feels like he was like, oh, he was nice to me. And he said some kind words. Yeah. 
fed my ego. So now all of a sudden, all these these reasons that we were given before are completely beside the point and, and, and we can do this. And I think it's that hypocrisy and that, you know, I mean, as Jason points out, uh, it, it behooves both sides to work together and it'd be very bad. You know, trade war is very bad for for a lot of companies in the United States. But the the rationale between being like, oh, this one company is is, is bad for these reasons, you know, it's always struck me as suspect. If there really is a security concern and there have been well, a lot of people who've made the case that there is, then that should be on its own. It shouldn't be levers to try to get better terms for a trade deal. I've been I've been absolutely I've been saying absolutely. this. I've been saying, well, let's see the evidence. I mean, I understand they can't tell us all the evidence, but if if you think Huawei is a problem, let's find out why. And there is some evidence now. The Wall Street Journal yeah. reported this week that Huawei gear is much more vulnerable to hackers than rivals' equipments. This is from a study uh, of what it's kind of a strange study. So I'm not I I don't know if I really understand it. It's from a company called Finite State, and what they did is they took uh, the firmware of a bunch of network uh, switches, 5G switches, and so forth. And they did it pro bono. They said not on behalf of any government. Although the fact that they feel like they have to say that. <laughs> Makes, makes me a, a little nervous. Uh, uh, they what they did is they analyzed more than one and a half unique files, one and a half million unique files embedded within ten thousand firmware images, uh, five hundred fifty-eight products within Huawei's enterprise networking product lines. They said the rate of vulnerabilities. Now maybe this is getting garbled by the journal, although the journal's tech reporting is usually pretty good. The rate of vulnerabilities found in Huawei equipment was far higher than average than the average found in devices manufactured by its rival and that more than half of the Huawei firmware images they tested contained at least one vulnerability which Finite State described as a potential backdoor that could allow an attacker with knowledge of the firmware and a corresponding key to log into the device. So this is the first smoking gun we've seen that maybe there is a backdoor in Huawei networking gear uh, perhaps they're either by error or by or, the or, intention. or intentional. Yeah, yeah. One of the one yeah. the part of that, that that really struck me, but beyond just the potential of having the back door, was the fact that older versions of the firmware had fewer vulnerabilities than newer versions. Yeah, and and that you know that could be a number of things. That could be poor QA. That could be you know intentional. You don't know, but you're right. Like that, and and I don't know a lot about the the company that put out that report, but that is certainly concerning, which again, goes back to what we were saying before. If there's a security issue, then that should be the focus and that should be the reason for the ban. But this shouldn't be used as leverage and then given as an excuse when trying to, you know, um, you know, organize it or, or, or I guess negotiate a trade the war. Problem, like that, the me, problem is, is, the is, is that the gov our government has been willing to use trade as well as other things like foreign aid as a, as a diplomatic weapon and that conflates these economic issues with other issues and it makes it really difficult uh, and it also makes the path meandering however i True, mean i think go ahead so so i i think that one of the things to to maybe remember is you know, it's almost two decades that the all the U.S. intelligence agencies have been pretty consistent in their mistrust of, of Huawei. Um, not just and, Huawei. Well, in this case, not just Huawei. Since 2012, they've been saying Huawei, ZTE, and Xiaomi, three the pretty big Chinese telecom companies. Yeah, James Clapper has been uh, one yeah, of the big drivers. General Clapper doesn't right, like him. Right. Uh, but it's not clear that that's based on well, we've been looking at the evidence and see here's the problems, or well, they're Chinese. Can you really trust them? That's what I don't know. I, I th well, I think the report, so so from the reports that I've read that I understand in terms of what the intelligence agencies have, some of the stuff that's either available publicly or through Freedom of Information Act, um, is that they what they don't trust is some very close relationships with people high up exactly. in Huawei with the Chinese yeah. military. They haven't been they haven't brought the hammer down as much on ZT, ZTE was a little they they sold some things to Iran um, right. and we we didn't like that and you know they were penalized for it essentially um, but they've th th not gotten nearly the scrutiny same thing with Xiaomi same thing with OnePlus same thing with a bunch of other chinese companies it's been Huawei that's that's really been picked on and as my my understanding is mostly is that the intelligence agencies don't trust this very close relationship with some people very high up inside Huawei you know their relationship with the chinese military uh, and of course it's, all, it's, the, it's case also the kind of things that Huawei's building 
you know, the, the true, building right? things that are yeah. that are at the root stuff. of our yeah. right backbone yeah. stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. not just a matter of your phone or uh, you know other consumer devices. It's things that actually, if if they were controlled by a government, uh, would be very bad. What we had one of our visitors US. to the studio the other day works for Nokia in their five G division. I said, "Is this an opportunity for you?" He said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, 100%. oh, yeah. So Nokia and Ericsson, who also make 5G gear, yes. but are much smaller yes. than Huawei in this realm, they're stepping up, you know. But the oh, problem has been that I mean, U.S. companies are not offering quality gear at a reasonable price. No, they're price. not. No. And they never have. I mean, 4G was they're led not by Ericsson. Game. Yeah. Um, uh, for, for, yeah. for a large thing. And then and then Huawei really has come up, you know, since then. But when 4G was starting to expand, that was all Ericsson stuff. And I mean, Nokia, the reason that it still exists the way it does is because of its networking patents and, and the infrastructure it builds there, right? Like that was separate from its mobile phone division. Um, but you're right, there haven't been. The U.S. companies, we've never had a real presence in that space. And on the other hand, we buy a lot of stuff from Chinese companies. I buy Lenovo laptops. Absolutely. And even if it's not run by somebody who used to work for the Chinese military, like Huawei is, I I think I might be wrong, but I think the structure of of the Chinese government is such that any company that's a Chinese company is at any time uh, at the mercy of the whims of the government, right? If President Xi says to Lenovo, we'd like you to embed this malware, what's Lenovo going to do? Say no? On the other hand, I think we also should rely on the fact that the Chinese want to do business with us. And if they feel like their gear is not trustworthy, I mean, we've demonstrated. We practically put ZTE out of business last year. We almost did the right. same thing with Huawei this year. We've demonstrated that that's bad for business to, to do that. Now, this is yeah. the 2012 U.S. government review. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Review of security risks associated with Huawei did not find clear evidence the company was being used by China but concluded the gear presented risks due to the presence of many vulnerabilities. And so that's what this most recent report also said. It's not that, you know, these look like intentional backdoors. It's impossible to tell, but they are, in effect, de facto backdoors. So that's a good enough reason. They're just not secure. The, the fear from the U.S. and Europe about gear from, so so Huawei makes a lot of really good gear, a really good backhaul gear for 5G infrastructure. And a lot of this happened just as they were on the doorstep for making a lot of inroads into this 5G, giant 5G build out that's about to happen, uh -huh. right? So so mm -hmm. don't underestimate the fact that the, the, a lot of this sort of FUD, you know, um, if you want to call it that, whether you, if, you, if you don't believe it, that's what it is, right? Um, that this happened just as they were on the doorstep of, of signing a lot of big deals all around the world to put a Huawei um, gear as the backbone to a lot of 5G networks. Um, and this has scared off a lot of that, even in places like South Korea. South Korea is their biggest um, trading partner. Right. Or they are South Korea's biggest trading partner. Um, and South Korea has kind of pulled back and now um, gone with more Korean manufacturers to build their network. Um, for just as one example, right? And and if you're if you're having a hard time convincing South Korea, you're gonna have a lot harder time convincing Canada or the United States, you know, or France or whomever. So. Um, you know, a lot of this trade war stuff, there's a lot of posturing that goes on. Um, and this isn't going to be a pop, very popular thing to say. But, you know, I, I think Trump, for, for better or worse, one thing he does understand well is negotiations. He's been doing it his whole life as a real estate, um, you know, uh, tycoon. And so he understands in, in negotiations, you can say things you don't necessarily mean um, to try to gain more ground and give you better bargaining power and better negotiation um, tactics. So I think that I don't think he really wants a trade war with China, but he wants to get better terms for the right. U.S. in our trade negotiations. The, the threat of it is bad. Uh, but of course, of we, we also understand the threat of a trade war with China is bad for the U.S. too. And tariffs are taxes. And uh, ask a soybean farmer how he feels about the whole thing. And it's not going to be a good story. I have to say, though, after reading this Wall Street Journal story, I'm starting to think maybe there is evidence that Huawei... For instance, if you were going to put back doors in your gear, you wouldn't put something that says... Backdoor for the Chinese Back government. Door. Yeah. <laughs> right. You do something that looks like it could have been a mistake, like a hardwired password, which is a common error made in firmware. Um, but there are some things that are a little suspicious. You mentioned uh, uh, this, Jason. According to the journal, a particularly unusual finding 
was that security problems became worse, at least in at least one instance, for users who yeah. patched a switch with an updated version. That's supposed to the fix is supposed to make it better. So suddenly yeah. these patches are coming out with more holes than before. Yeah, no, that's that's a problem for sure because you know um, you could make the argument that a lot of uh, so some of the issues with some of these things is that you have bad you know opsec um, on behalf of uh, you know the municipalities and companies and people who use this equipment, right? But if they're doing best practices and updating firmware and trying to install updates, and then they're being less secure as a result of that, that's a big problem. And that's 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 a concern for sure, because you should never be putting the people who are maintaining your systems in the position where they have to question, should we install this update or not? The journal quotes Michael Wessel, who's a member of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission, who says it's hard to see that the range and depth of the vulnerabilities could be anything other than intentional. So... This is maybe the smoking gun I've been saying all along. I, I wanted to see, so maybe there, maybe there really is a problem. And uh, well, when you hear people like James Clapper talk, it sounds like from the way he speaks and other uh, intelligence uh, officials that they have seen things that they can't talk about. I have seen things no other That's man right. should see, <laughs> <laughs> and particularly not you know. Yeah, and you can understand the why they can't rules. talk about it. Right, right, right. Yeah, but that—that's the kind of thing right there that uh, that I think should give everybody pause. Yeah. Um, let's take a break. We're going to come back. We have much more to talk about, including the ebook apocalypse, the hackers in your curtains, <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, let's see. There's got to be uh, there's got to be something of equal interest. Um, oh no. Eh, oh well. I had a great tease, but I lost it. Yeah. That's that's kind of the story of my life. I had a tease, but I lost it. There's no point in teasing on a podcast. If it's too good, you just skip the ad. And I don't want you to skip the ad because it's from Captera. I really like these guys. A lot of times I get calls from people saying, I, you know, I have a veterinary business. What's the best software for me? Like I would know what the best veterinary software is. I can tell you one thing. A lot of businesses are and I include ourselves in this, for are using software that somebody wrote years ago somebody who's long gone not being maintained or it's by a company a little tiny company and, and they, they never updated it from windows vista uh or you know that kind of thing right you i know there's some of you who are running old computers just because the uh the line of business software you absolutely have to have will not work on anything else this new york city subway is being run on os2 <laughs> so this happens i know this happens but there is if for your business a modern solution. We we had uh, an intern write us a sales system that, but I swear Lisa curses every time she has to use it. We're finally getting a good modern CRM system thanks to Captera. Captera has an amazing selection. It's a directory of business software, 700 categories. Yes, CRM, IT project management, e-commerce, link management tools, web conferencing, every category, but also direct line of business software like veterinary office or yoga studio software. The thing that always amazes me, you can search for the most obscure thing and you'll find a dozen programs and then you can narrow it down because they have filters. You can filter it on product rating how many seats it supports, how it's deployed on premises or in the cloud, various features. Can you make appointments? Can you send bills? That kind of thing. Then find the ones that fit your exact needs. Compare them side by side up to four at a time. They'll even show you a list of related categories for further options. But the best part of Captera is the reviews. There are almost now a million reviews on Captera. There is a thousand new reviews every day by actual users. They're very careful. They vet these reviews. So when you look at software and you say, well, maybe this will be good for us, you can read those reviews and you can know somebody who's actually using it. This is the pros. These are the cons. No matter what kind of software you need, Captera makes it easy to discover the right solution fast. And once you find that software, pay it forward. Leave a review. That's, that helps other buyers as well. All of this is absolutely free. No charge. Millions of people use Captera to find the right tools for their business. There's no, there's no upsell. There's no free. It's not free. It's free, free. Captera.com slash twit. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot -E com slash twit. If you've been assigned this weekend to find software for your business, I just, I just made your weekend. Captera.com slash twit. Captera is software selection simplified. And we thank them for their support of twit. 
Thank you for supporting us back by using that special URL, capterra.com slash twit. So sometime this week, books that you bought in Microsoft's ebook store will just disappear like magic. And it, it, now, to Microsoft's credit, they're going to reimburse you the cost of the book. And if you put notes in it, if you wrote stuff, if you if you put your own content in there, it's still it's going to disappear. But they'll give you twenty five dollars, which is I think very nice of them. They're not required to because, guess what? You never owned those books. And this is I think a really interesting story because it underscores a fact that nobody really wants to think about, but it's absolutely true. You don't own your books, your digital books. You don't own your digital movies, your your digital TV shows. You may have bought them, but because of DRM, if that company stops supporting the authentication server or decides not to support them, it's bye-bye, baby. Amazon you may have bought them three times. Yeah. In three different formats. Yeah. Right. Yep. Like, like I've done with Star Wars and multiple other things. So uh, this actually very famously happened and very ironically happened uh, when Amazon removed a version of 1984 from your Kindle. Right, right. That, that was not That's actually right. uploaded by the right publisher. It was it was from a different. Right. Uh, it, it was it was like a pirated copy, so to speak. But yeah, yeah that was. They ironic. were right to remove it, but it must have been they a shock were. to people who paid for it. Um, and I believe, and I can't remember how Sony's ebook store worked, but they had an ebook store early on. And when they shut that down, I don't remember if they transferred the the books or what happened. But uh, no, I mean, this is this is always concerning, as you said. And and I'm obviously not speaking uh, uh, on behalf of, of Microsoft in any way for this. Um, I'm as concerned as anyone else is when it comes to, you know, um, when we have to, I guess, look at the big picture of, like as you said, you don't own your digital content. You are you are you own a license to it, but you don't actually own it yourself. And I think this is why you know the EFF has successfully fought for um, I guess uh, various um, uh, terms in, in in some years where you can uh, overcome uh, DRM. You know to to own your own copies of things. Various exceptions to to various um, copyright laws. Can't, is it legal? So look, everybody knows there's plenty of ways to remove the copy protection. Totally. And, uh, you know, I might or might not have done that to my audio books because Same. I spent a lot of money on them and it would be nice oh. to be able to keep them. I mean, I'll, I'll say it outright. I definitely have. Uh, because Is it illegal to do that? That's no. unclear. There have been exceptions that have been ah. part of various things. But, it, I mean, it's unclear. I think if it's for private use, it would you be You can make different. backup copies. I know that that's legal of... of what is, so why do you say it's not, uh, Dwight? Fill us in. Well, there have been court cases, particularly involving handbrake, I think, that uh, indicated that, you know, you can uh, make that, do it for personal use only, and that's the extent of it. Is it a backup copy, or? It's considered a backup copy, but it's also personal use only. Yeah. Yeah, there have been various um, exceptions to various parts of, of, of the, the DMCA um, that have allowed for this. I don't know if, if it was renewed the most recent time. I know the EFF has fought for it before. And, and as um, uh, uh, Dwight was mentioning, um, the, the, the DVD CSS case, uh, the DVD John case has said that you can use those things. But I don't know specifically for this type of DRM and for these types of books things. But yeah, I mean, I think that if you're not distributing the content of it's for your own use case, whether it's actually technically legal or not, the the real you know ramifications are are uh, you know nearly non-existent. That said, I am not a lawyer, but I do think I think this it's is why I think I think you're right. I think it's illegal to circumvent the copy protection schemes that they use. You, it's easy to do. Anybody can find programs to do it. But I think that it's illegal to distribute those programs. Isn't it, uh, Dwight, the DMCA says you can't circumvent copy protection? Um, I believe that there was a court case that basically said for, and I think it was the DVD John case, that you can use the product Handbrake. I mean, it's still out there. Handbrake, uh, interestingly, no longer does that, by the way. When you download Handbrake to rip a you DVD, download, you have to uh, download another it says, thing. go download VLC. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Because they don't want, so maybe they won the court case, but they're sure acting like they lost. They don't want you to be able to crack DVDs with just Handbrake. You have to use 
those French guys program. <laughs> there is a, a, a rule as of 10-26, 2018, there is an exemption to prohibition on circumvention of copyright protection systems for access control technologies. So there is still an exception for this, depending on uh, on a couple of, of, of scenarios. So in theory, if you were able to, you know, if it's for personal use case or, um, you know, if- You'd have a like, pretty good case if you had Microsoft eBooks yeah, you and they were going to stop this working this week- Right. And what it's you did, no what I did, Your right. Honor, was I make it so they would still work. Otherwise, I wouldn't have them anymore. But but then you shouldn't take the money from Microsoft <laughs> if they the, the pay ba they pay you back because then you're stealing, right? So so are there programs out there that actually will strip? Oh yeah, uh, from eBooks. Yeah. Not that I know yeah. about that, but oh yeah. No, I mean there, it, it's certainly it's not like there are plugins for Calibre or anything like that. Um, no. Yeah, no, and you couldn't yeah. Google them if you couldn't just Google them and find them. <laughs> that would be I mean, I mean, that I mean, would be wrong. Again, they're not distributed with that software, but they're on various things. Yeah, there are. Um, I actually downloaded then, a tool that strips copy protection out of Audible. Uh, same, DR, DRM. As, as did I. As not did because I. I and I still buy books from Audible, and I love right. Audible, and I will always buy books from Audible. But I want to be able to put them on a backup drive and still be able to use them if Audible goes out of business. Well, my issue was that I have three different accounts and I've had some issues trying to get them combined into well, one. And and I'm genuinely worried that when they do that process, I yeah, will lose, lose them. some of my books. And like I have, you know, over a hundred, you know, titles and I and have five hundred. And see yeah, the, and, the problem and, and, is if that authentication server is no longer on, every time you listen to that book, it goes out and says, Does 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 Christina own this book? And it says, Yes, she does, and you can play it. But if it's if it didn't respond Right, then you're locked out. Um, and I mean, I think this is this is why you know DRM in a lot of ways is is dangerous. I mean, I think that in an ideal world, because these things are going to happen. I think in an ideal world, and this comes down to rights holders, so you can't hold the companies necessarily fully responsible. But in an ideal world, if you were to do this, I think the best thing to do would be to unlock, you know, get give users a way to unlock the the um, the content um, and and have it without DRM on their systems. But I do understand that there are probably you know, their own contracts that they made with publishers and whatnot that, you know, requires some sort of DRM to be there. And and if they choose to no longer maintain the servers, that doesn't change the contract they've made with the with the content um, owners. One so, thing that does happen, and I wonder if the Librarian of Congress will, will say something about this, because this is all comes down to, oddly enough, the Librarian of Congress, right. who can make exemptions and has in the past. Yes. Um, and I wonder if if th this might be a, a something that the Librarian of Congress might say. For instance, if the authentication server doesn't work anymore, you have the right to remove the the copy protection or something like that. I would like if, to see if that. the device that you're if the device that you're using does not connect to the internet um, on the day that they turn this off and the and in theory they stop working, can you still read them if it doesn't talk to the internet? Mm. In this case, I don't think so, because in this case, the only way you could read these books was using the Edge browser. So My guess is, but it's purely a guess, that you could read them for a little while. But at some point, and who knows right. what that is, maybe every month, every week, every day, mm. I don't know. But at some point, there's going to be a check. They're not going to do it all the time. That's a burden. It's going gonna, it's gonna to reach out. But say, at some point, it's going to yeah. say, okay, it's the 90-day timer's up. Uh, is this still legit? Exactly. I, th I think you're right. I think that's probably how that works is that they have like a, a certain a call home thing, and you have to call home within X period of time. Um, and then if, if you're not connected within that period of time, it will give you some sort of error. Yeah, I would Is that how Kindle works? So with a, with a Kindle device, you can turn off Wi-Fi in the Kindle, so it no longer has no, access to the internet, that, and you can still read books. But yeah, I, I think the Kindle is tied to the device itself. That's it. So You're right. It, and and so it, in that and that's case, the same with Audible. It authenticates when you first set it up. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so in that case, if you never connected that Kindle to the internet ever again, yeah, you could read those books forever. Right. But. Um, if it if it connected to the internet and then it found something different, like in the case when they removed the the uh, the non licensed books, then that's how it's able to do that. But yeah, I think Kindle and Audible both they're linked to the device itself. They get a key because that's how Audible was able to work with the iPod. You know, the iPod didn't have Wi Fi, um, but once it's on there and it's on that hard drive, it's there for life. Um, but uh, if you wanted to update or add new things, then obviously, you know, it could it could still check to make sure it has access to those things. It's just a, I I just think it's a and maybe I'm just an old man, you know, and uh, I don't, uh, paper books never expire, but I don't want to fill my 
house with paper books and vinyl yeah. records or plastic CDs because I don't, because I think digital copies are great. I mean, uh, I've stopped buying DVDs for the most part. I just buy it on iTunes and it's 4K. In fact, iTunes recently upgraded a bunch of my DVDs that were yeah. just to 4K because yeah, there was they a, do it for free. And, and there's this and there's this great service called a uh, Movies Anywhere that all the major studios except for Lionsgate yeah. and Paramount are part of, where you can link your iTunes, your Vudu, your Google, your um, uh, you know uh, Microsoft, a couple other accounts together, and so your Amazon. So all of your libraries are the same no matter what service you're on, and that's amazing. Um, and they've and got so apps on Roku and Apple TV and everywhere. But let's great. but let's point out that's only be, we're operating uh, at the pleasure of the corporations. <laughs> oh, I mean, sure. it's a nice thing, and the minute they turn it off, it, it will be gone, and I we mean, don't have control over it. I mean, make no mistake. I'm, 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 you know, damning with faint praise here, right? Like this is an amazing thing that I they've feel done. Like, and the I feel like they're offering us candy, saying, "And well, look, right. you can watch it on all the things." And then someday it's going. <laughs> totally, but but, but I, I, I would say, I guess, the defense of that is that we've been treated so poorly by these companies for so many years, and told you can't access these things other places, and you can only, if you buy it on iTunes, you can only watch it on these devices, whatnot. That you know, like we we feel amazing when we're like, oh, they're actually letting us use our content the ways that we think we should be able to, um, you know, we, we get excited about things maybe we shouldn't be excited by, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I have still a ton of Blu-rays and, and DVDs, um, but I've stopped buying physical books for the most part. And I, I don't buy a lot of physical media anymore because I don't have room for it, even though I love it. Um, but it is scary when you think about, well, what is the future of this? You know, and I, I'm a data hoarder. So you know, I think a lot about the, those things. Yeah. Like, what's going to happen in twenty years? How will I be able to to play this content or use this content? Well, so I, th that's what happened to me. I was backing up these five hundred Audible books because normally you just download it when you want to listen to it uh, on the new device. But I thought I should really have a backup of it of all of them. So whenever I buy new books, I now back it up. I put it on my NAS. Eventually, it goes to Amazon's Glacier. So I mean, it's because you know, years from now, I would like to know that those books are still available. But before I did that. I took, I stripped out the copy protection because the, otherwise I've done, there's no point in backing it up. So uh, I'm looking at a, um, a FAQ on circumvention and the DMCA. Um, and it specifically says it is illegal to disable an access control device in the storage media of an entertainment product, creating a patch for a software program or electronics product. It's explicit that you can't do that. So, but again, I don't think any judge, if you said, well, your honor, my books that I bought from Microsoft won't work after April or after July. Uh, I can't imagine a judge would throw you in jail. No. And I, I would, I would, I, like, if we're being completely honest and realistic, like no one's going to know about this unless you're distributing uh, things on the internet for other yeah, people to yeah, Don't do that. Right. Be no ethical. One, right. Like, so, so like realistically, no one is going to know if you do this. Like, it's just one of those things. I think it's a, it, it's a technicality. I'm not saying that people should ignore the law, but like, come on, no one's going to know. Like, Here's another example of the industry kind of doling out a little, little candy so you would pay no attention. Remember for a long time, I don't know if they still do, Blu-ray discs and DVDs came with a digital version of the movie yes. protected yes. by ultraviolet. Right, and ultraviolet's going away. Closing in July 31st. Right. No, which, and, and this is, this is, this is an issue because I, I was mentioning movies anywhere earlier and that was Disney's, uh, it started as key chest. It was their, um, response to ultraviolet. Um, and it was better technology in a lot of ways, but Paramount and Lionsgate and a couple other smaller studios, uh, MGM, um, uh, never were part of it. They were big on the, the um, ultraviolet train. And so it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Um, Voodoo is interestingly a um, library for both. So if you have stuff on Voodoo, presumably it will be converted, I guess, to your Voodoo library, but whether it will then be accessible in your other linked libraries remains to be seen. But yeah, no, you're exactly right. This was this was a big play by the movie industry to try to create a DRM way of, of distributing, you know, digital copies of movies easily to try to prevent people from downloading. And uh, it never really took off for a lot of reasons. It was hard to set up accounts. Um, there were a lot of, you know, issues around quality and 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 codes were, were hard. And what would usually happen was that the also the backend software was so hard to use that most of the studios just wound up giving people iTunes codes instead. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is a lot of people in the data hoarders community and in the ultraviolet community, um, two weird groups that I'm 
part of, um, have been talking a lot about this. Yeah. You are, you are a strange, have you met You're my little wrong. baby Jibo? Here's another example. I paid $900 for this robot. Aww. It stopped working. It died the other day because the company, uh, turned off the servers. I now have a $900 piece of plastic. Wow. That, there's no wow. recourse for that. That's it. No. No, I mean, it's kind of like I remember when um, when Google shut down Revolve, the the home um, uh, uh, kind Same of thing. a remember that? home stuff. Yeah. And, and I mean, and I think that this is why it's important to look at open standards and at least having certain things available so that in the event that these companies go out of business or they change models or whatever, there can be a way for you to locally still have a server that will respond to those types of things where you can at least on your own, maybe it doesn't give you any updates or do anything else, but you could at least, you know, still communicate with these types of devices because sure. this is what's so different about the current world we're in, which is that so many of the things that we buy are completely incumbent on, you know, third-party services that that are living in a cloud somewhere. And all it takes is a change in an API or a business decision change or somebody going out of business. And what you have, whether it's hardware or software, is no longer going to work. Here is uh, a recording of the end of Jibo. Aw. Goodbye, Jibo. I want to say I've really enjoyed our time together. Thank you very, very much for having me around. Maybe someday, when robots are way more advanced than today, and everyone has them in their homes, you can tell yours that I said hello. I wonder if they'll the be able to do this. The last Aww. dance. The Aww. last Jibo dance. This is really depressing. It's so depressing. You it, didn't spend nine hundred dollars on this piece of. <laughs> I mean, I mean, okay. So I had an Ibo. Remember the Ibo? Um, when Sharper Image dog, went out of business, robot dog. Yeah. yeah, the robot yeah, dog. When right. Sharper Image went out of business, I got one really cheap, and I loved it. But they have had issues, and they weren't connected to the internet um, that same way. But said they have like battery issues, where the batteries are custom, and you can't get them anymore. And and so in in Japan, people have had like massive funerals, you know, for them. Like people, <laughs> no, it's very, so people are very upset. Like they had these things, Leo. Like you laugh. Oh yeah. But people have had these as like their home pets for like Absolutely. eighteen years. It's like losing, you know, Absolutely. something else. It's a big deal. Um, and so, you know, I, when that happened, I, I was upset that, you know, the batteries can't charge anymore and that my IBO is, is no longer functioning and it's just a thing in my mom's basement. But, you know, it's still, if I, if you could presumably get a custom battery could come back to life like this, I look at it and I'm so sad. I'm like this, I know. This, you know, like you, you go through the trouble of making this, you know, anthropomorphic kind of, you know, being to get us all to like the robots and then you like turn it off. It's like the movie AI, the, the Steven Spielberg movie. Yeah. It's really depressing. Yeah. yeah. We did a big feature on this in CNET actually this week and it just ran. And, and in fact, the one is on replay on the CNET front door right now on um, Sony Ibo. And we went to uh, the homes of several of our uh, uh, several of our readers who have Sony Ibo and just uh, you know love it and treat it like one of the you know member of the family. So there's a great totally. video. It's about seven eight minutes, and uh, they are super attached to it. And in many cases, they have other real pets. And so uh, so we have the first video there. You see it with the cat on the. Uh, on there's the, a new there's a new there. Ibo though, isn't there? Yeah, there's there a new is. one. It's in Japan yeah. only. And oh. I think it's going to be it, cloud connected the same way. But you'd be stupid to buy it now, knowing that at some point. Well, of course, you're stupid but to get a dog in general. They always die somehow. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. basically, who was it said a, a, a you know I'll never have a dog. It's just a you know you're just buying into grief twelve years down the road, right? <laughs> um, it goes so into the cloud. One, but you would think probably. a robot would last longer than you, right? Maybe. So Not, Leo, is that less, all hackable? Is, um, is your nine hundred dollar device at all hackable? Could you I, do something am, to bring it back uh, to life? At some point, I'm going to let Burke decapitate her, but I, I don't, <laughs> not yet. Her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, see, that would be the interesting not thing ready. again. Like, this I'm is why I'm 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 a proponent of open source for some of these things because because I'm, I'm completely in line with companies. Not like I don't 
think that you should hold any company accountable to maintaining an old server for a long time. Like last year, Sonos got some flack because literally some ActiveX flash thing for a controller they last sold in 2006, they were like, okay, we're not going to support this anymore. Um, and, and we'll give you a certain amount of money to buy, you know, a new controller and you can use our app. And people freaked out. And like, but I understand they had like old, you know, unsafe code that they were having to maintain with some other other stuff for a thing that hadn't been sold in 12 years. Like, I, I understand that a business reality say you can't maintain this forever. But in a perfect world, you could say, OK, but, you know, if we're using open source things or whatnot, we will at least open source how some of this stuff works so you can run your own server if you have the ability to do that. Um, and it's even yes. a business opportunity for other places to maybe say, hey, we will host this, you know, in a cloud for you and you can access it. But like to me, that would be the best way to, to, to do these things is to say, you know, if you have the means to do this yourself, you can you can set up your own local thing and and still that's engage like, with your device. It's such a great idea, and it really is. You know, that's like good hygiene and good you know digital manners of the twenty first century. If you're going out of business, like open source your stuff, put it up on GitHub. Let somebody else, if they have the resources, or even hobbyists, yeah. um, you know, do something uh, with it. If you're no longer going to you know be the uh, the curator and the you know guardian of it, as it were. Yeah, somebody on Twitter just mentioned Anki, and that's that's another one, right? Like that, you know, they they went under. I have, and been, I have a sad um, number of these actually. <laughs> the Anki uh, racetrack. Yeah, wow. and I mean that's and that's the thing, right? And they There's, killed it's, Vector. It's, yeah. mm -hmm. And and I mean Anki is right now it's an iOS app, and so presumably it'll work maybe the next version. But there's going to be a time when when that code is not going to work correctly, and so again, I think it would be great if you know the Anki people would open source what they have so that somebody else can you know, find a way to make it work if they if they have the capabilities. At least give people the option. You know, like I'm not saying you need to maintain it or or, you know, run queries, but just putting it out there, I think that would be really nice. So it's a great idea. Uh, there's a open source uh home automation uh package called OpenHab. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about where and everything just stood use standards, then you wouldn't have the problem of the back end shutting down at some point. You'd be running your own thing. Yeah, I think so. I think things like that, um, I mean, obviously that's really good. Or just, you know, if like when, when Google shut down, you know, Revolve, it would have been really nice if they had released some of the code so that people could locally run those things. Because the problem with Revolve was that the devices themselves still worked. It was just that because there wasn't a central server to connect to, they couldn't do anything. But there's no reason it couldn't have been, somebody couldn't have, you know, um, augmented things to run locally on a network. So yeah, but I mean, I think as much as you can use open standards, obviously that's that's even better. But I don't know. I, I like the idea that says if you're going to get out of the market or go out of business, you know, open source your stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, this is kind of a depressing segment. <laughs> uh, you want more depression? Another, a third Florida city. <laughs> It's, it's fallen prey. So it started with Baltimore, which got ransomware uh, encrypted for three weeks. I don't know what's the city of Baltimore. I think they're still hobbling along. Yeah, they're still they're still uh, fighting it. They did not pay, right? They didn't pay the ransomware guys. Mm -hmm. No. Then uh, Riviera uh, Beach, Florida, a small town, sixty five thousand people, decided they got hit. They decided to pay six hundred thousand dollars. To get their ransomware unlocked. Uh, on uh, Monday, Lake City, Florida. This is a Florida man story. Lake City, Florida, another small Florida city, voted to pay half a million dollars in ransom, to Bitcoin, to the ransomware gang to get their data back. Now, a third Florida city uh, has also fallen. They're trying to decide what to do. Uh, Biscayne uh, Bay, the problem is it's a really tiny city, 1,200 people. Uh, and I, I don't know if what the, what they decided. They had a town, the village, whatever whatever they call it, a village hall meeting last night. I don't know what they ended up deciding to do. Is it ever a good idea to pay the ransom? I mean, I guess it depends on how much you need that information, how good your resources are like in some cases in some of these cities i think the reason they pay the six hundred thousand dollars as bad as it is is that 
they the have cost insurance. of recreating those things. Well, A, they have insurance. B, the cost of those things is going to be substantial. And C, they might, they clearly don't have the IT staff who's skilled enough to do what they need to so do. So next right? time, pay a tenth of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and hire an IT staff. Yeah. Or, yeah. Is it, or is it inevitable? Should every company be saying we're next? Every city in the country be saying we're next? If it it only matters if you don't have a backup, right? If you have no backup, well, it has um, to be more than a backup. It has to be an immutable backup because mm -hmm. if That's you true. if right. you've got a backup right. running and it backs up the encrypted data right. on top of the good data, right? So you have to have backup that isn't going to get corrupted. And, and these weren't doable. just script. And these and these weren't just script kiddies. You know, these are people who no. kind of are are putting out there some fairly sophisticated things. And just the random IT guy, you know, that they hire is not necessarily himself going to have the himself or herself going to have the skills to be able to go in there and and fix it. You you're going to have to hire go outside, and it probably is going to cost you more than the five hundred thousand or six hundred thousand dollars to recover from well, it. Well, and you might have a responsibility if you're this if you're the city council. And you know that on there is the tax rolls. On there is every you know plan for every building that's going to be built over the next five years. And you don't have a way of recovering that except to pay the ransom. I think I can understand why you'd pay the ransom. You, you would have. That's a huge breach of response of your responsibility. Right? And you damn well I mean, better be sure that you don't. It's not going to happen again. I mean, once yeah. this, mm -hmm. once, you, once they they are out of your system, supposedly out of your system, you better make sure that they don't come back. Now, my yeah. my, my other the, thought on this is, of course, no individual listening to the show should ever pay the ransomware fee because these are bad guys. You're like right. saying, oh, I'll give you $10,000. I'm sure you'll give me the key. No, they're just going to say thank you, goodbye. But I think if you're a high-profile case like these cases, you're probably likely to get the key because the ransomware authors do want you to think it works. Otherwise, you <laughs> would never pay, right? No, totally. I mean, and that's the thing, too. I mean, it, it, it's... I think it's always probably uh, stressful to, to consider, am I going to pay and are they going to unlock it or not? But it's in their best interest to unlock it because that's how yeah. they can convince people to continue to pay them. Right. Um, my dad, my dad has been the victim of ransomware, not oh. once, but twice. Oh, Ooh. Uh, um, What did he do? Did he pay? He paid and then the, my mom found out and they ended up, you know, I, I think that they um, disputed the charge with American Express or something. And I don't know. Um, That's good. Put your Bitcoin in American Express, kids. And, um, <laughs> and <laughs> it, yeah, yeah cause they didn't ask him to do a Bitcoin thing. It was, it was oh, they wanted real money. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and so then, you know, my mom found out and then they, you know, uh, uh, I guess disputed with Amex and it was, it was fine. Um, and the second time I, I think that I was just like, we have a backup from a while ago. You have most of your stuff in, in Office 365. We're we're just starting over on this. And then, um, you know, I made sure that he wasn't running some of the stuff he was running before. But I don't, I live really far away from my parents, so I can't monitor his activities. But, you know, as I understand it, they did unlock his system. Um, it's Good. Just, you know, okay. But, Good but know. you know... It's just it's 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 a ridiculous kind of scenario, and they go after people who aren't tech savvy, and they go after, uh, you know, um, municipalities in this case. Who, <laughs> look, I mean, that's six hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money, and that's a lot of money for those towns. But again, if a they probably have insurance, and b the cost of not, you know, getting around it otherwise is probably way more than that. I I just hope that any of these cities who pay the ransom will then immediately conduct a real security audit and hire and pay people, um, even though it's going to be expensive for them to actually secure and create best practices around what they're doing. Um, unfortunately, I kind of don't believe that'll happen, but I, that's what I hope they do, because otherwise this is just going to happen again. Larry Dignan writing on a ZDNet said, it's actually in many cases a good idea to pay the ransomware. Um, the, many of the, these cities often said that was what we, our advice was that we were given. Fortunately, I think they had some insurance, although I imagine their, their ransomware insurance costs are going to go. Through. Oh yeah. I didn't know you could get ransomware insurance. I might be looking into that. Um, it, <laughs> the FBI says, still says, do not pay ransomware. There's some reasons not to. One is it just encourages them. Mm -hmm. Uh, two is there's no guarantee you'll get your data back. Um, the, and in most cases, the FBI these also come in. Says, go ahead, sorry, uh, go, most, ahead go ahead, Jason. No, in, in no, Jason. I'm gonna I'm gonna rule on this one. <laughs> 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 I always wanted the, to be a the judge. The FBI 
also says that, you know, there are annually now over a billion dollars in losses from yeah. ransomware that's paid. And that is likely a tip of the iceberg oh. because yeah, nobody's going to report. The ones, that, yeah. Ex, those are the ones that actually reported it. To yeah. The FBI. Yeah. Most of the time it's not reported. Yeah. Totally. And in almost all these cases, it's uh, done by uh, spear phishing. Right. People, come, they come in and they trick you into installing the software on your machine by clicking on a link. I think you have another story about a guy who almost fell for uh, a similar yes. thing in your list today. A security guy, a guy right, who a knew guy better. Almost. Yeah. Right. And so it's, you know, it's it's kind of also embarrassing for for the city because one of their employees fell for something that pro hopefully they have been trained about. You know, I think every every company and every institution does a lot of training around this. Uh, and but people still fall for it, like yeah. the security guy in this instance. Well, it, it uh, there this is the thing. And I still see in uh, and I know the Houston Chronicle never does this, but I still see in or CNET or Microsoft and I've been many other places say oh if if you don't know the person that the email came from don't open it and that's exactly the wrong that's exactly the wrong advice because it always comes from somebody you know yep. you often, think you know right yeah or right. your boss uh so it's really important so yeah that's job one is to train employees not to click links not to open emails and not to open attachments especially to be suspicious of, of attachments from the boss or from coworkers, because the spear phishing attacks, especially for, I'm sure this is why it's cities, it's happening in cities, it's easy to see who's in the city government. It's on right. the website. So you go to the say, who's the city manager? Okay, that's his name. Okay, who's the uh, comptroller? Okay, that's his name. Send an email from the city manager to the comptroller saying, here's the spreadsheet. I'm a little concerned about the numbers here. You better open this and look at it. How many comptrollers are going to say, wait a minute, that couldn't have, they're going to open it. So that's job one. Job two, have a good backup, an immutable backup. I, I, I've been told, check me if I'm wrong, that Google does not allow spear phishing and ransomware attacks to go through because they scan and they and they block these malware attachments. And certainly, if you have uh, good intrusion detection and uh, you know hardware firewalls, uh, we have hardware Sophos, Sophos hardware running to protect us, Cisco umbrella and stuff like that. That kind of software is going to filter that stuff out before it even gets to your employees. Am I right? Yeah, that's true. Um, and, and you know, like, you know, we have things like uh, at Office 365, somebody in IRC mentioned this, and yeah, this is true. There's, um, you know, advanced threat protection yes. um, for, for things like that, uh, that go into things like that. And I mean, this is actually arguably in some ways kind of a, a reason to use software as a service if you're these types of governments, because you can get updates to these types of things. I think the issue is that most of the time they're running older versions of, you know, server products and maybe of, of you know, um, uh, email servers or other things. And, um it's not doing that because, you know, they were making decisions, you know, about their stack a while ago and and haven't um, allocated money in the budget to update. Um, and, and that makes sense, right? I mean, things are expensive and you can't expect uh, small governments especially to always be up to date on stuff. I think, um, though, if you used Office 365 or G Suite, you would... Most yes. of these threats would not happen. It they wouldn't. Be... They wouldn't. But but the issue is is that you know you, they might have set something up in two thousand three, right? Yeah. And maybe haven't updated since then because you were you were talking in your last ad break about things like that. Like this is a reality of how these yep. things work. It's 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 a it's reality for small businesses. It's even a bigger reality for small governments um, and for city governments. Um, and and as we've seen with like Detroit, that's a much bigger city than you would think would be impacted by that. But you know if they have other pressing concerns. I can understand that people in their, you know, city council would argue against spending money on on tech stuff. Uh, this is probably why we need more people who are tech savvy to be in roles in government at all stages. If, yeah. if we're being honest, I want to take, amen, uh, amen, uh, amen, sister. I want to take a break and uh, come back. I will uh, talk about this Robert Heaton piece, which is a really great piece. How he was seven words away from being spearfished, and this is a software engineer, a guy who is as knowledgeable as all as any of us. Uh, and still almost, almost uh, fell for it. And it's a very, it's a very telling uh, story, but that we'll do that in just a little bit. And if you missed anything this week on Twit, well, you missed a mouthful. Watch. Previously on Twit. <laughs> that the Motorola Zoom, uh, Google's very Classic. first tablet. And, uh, so I can't wait to unearth this time capsule. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see what apps you have installed on it. I do too. I bet you, you got Google goggles on there. Maybe. I could. I could have, uh, what was it, uh, Google Listen, was it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
Tech News Weekly. The Raspberry Pi 4 Model B is the first flagship level update. The Pi 3 released more than three years ago. 35 bucks gets you the computer that you see inside here. It's this week in enterprise tech. You don't go and set up a bank and use a plywood door for your vault. You invest in a good vault door. That city councilman, when you start looking at your budget, if you're going to be depending upon your IT group, you really and truly need to also invest in making sure you have a nice, strong vault door. Ham Nation. On this episode of Ham Nation, we've got a great report on Phil Day from everyone in the team and a few friends iOS today. It's here. I'm so excited. iOS 13. You'll notice immediately the icons are smaller. Plug a thumb drive, which in the past it would just go, I don't know what that is. Twit. We're no strangers to love. You know the rules and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and you. there's some great stuff in there. I remember that Microsoft or uh, that um not Zoom? Uh, the Motorola Zoom. Zoom. Yeah. Um, I it? remember having that thing under embargo and looking at it and then going, hold on, wait, I it, don't, you don't want me to that turn was it an ill um, the other way. Device. Um, <laughs> oh boy. Also, I noticed on your iPad. I noticed you had that bridged key that bridge keyboard yeah, on that. your iPad. Yeah. Man, that thing is that thing is awesome. And but with iOS 13 and the bridge keyboard now, it's practically a usable laptop. It's very interesting to use it. Uh, I think Apple's on the yeah. right track with iPad OS. So yeah, we have oh, that, it is. That's on our yeah. uh, hands-on tech channel, our review channel. We take uh, reviews from all of our shows and additional reviews of new products, and we put them on a channel called Hands On Tech. If you're not a subscriber to that, it's really nice, really good. Actually, what everybody should do is pick the podcasts you like. It maybe it's not mine. Maybe it's it's Jason's or Christina's or or. Uh, do you have a podcast? You must have a podcast, Dwight. I mean, how could you? No, 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 no podcast. Yeah. All right. That's well, so if you have a podcast that you love, subscribe to it. That's the best way to make sure that you get a episode every week automatically. You don't have to think about it. And it's the best way for us as podcasters uh, to build an audience. So don't forget to subscribe uh, to all of our Twit podcasts. When you get our Twit podcasts, you're downloading them from our content distribution network. It's really amazing. Cashfly is a CDN, a content delivery network, that gives you better speed, more reliability, it's up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods, up to 30 times faster than other CDNs. The way it works uh, is it has servers all over the world. And when your users come to download your app, to access your data, to download your podcast, they do it from the server that's closest to them. And that speeds things up by a lot. And because there's servers all over the world, it's got 100% SLA. I know people say you can't have more than whatever it is, five, nine, six, nine. No, you can because they have so many servers, they can guarantee 100%. And there's an SLA for that. The best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they are, what device they're on. I am a huge fan of Cashfly. I never get that 3 a.m. call, the content, the system's down where people aren't getting the podcast. The roads must roll and Cashfly keeps them rolling. Join the thousands, the trust. Cashfly's reliable network, LG, Microsoft, Adobe, Ars Technica. No billing spikes either because Cashfly works to make a plan tailored to your needs. We have very spiky demand, as you might imagine. You know, a lot of people download stuff Sunday night. They download Twit. But what Cashfly will work with you is to base it on your yearly trends, not your daily, nightly, weekly, monthly trends. That way you get a great result. See, 5x5 five five is on Cashfly. Cashfly's awesome. Uh, on average, customers who switch to Cashfly save 20%. That's a, that's a nice chunk of change. Just for you right now, Cashfly will give you a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill to see if you can save 20%. Roblox uses Cashfly. Zapier uses Cashfly. Procter & Gamble uses Cashfly. The NFL uses Cashfly. Twit.cashfly.com. See if you're paying more than you should be. Twit.cashfly.com. We thank Cashfly for literally bringing you our show. Robert Heaton, software engineer. This was such a great piece. I had to, I had mm -hmm. to bring it today. Um, three weeks ago, he writes, I received a very flattering email from the University of Cambridge asking me to judge the Adam Smith Prize for Economics. Wow, what an honor. <laughs> now, he does point out he's not an economist. He does have a subscription to The Economist. 
and <laughs> he's read Capital in the 21st Century, but he's not an economist, yet that did not raise any alarm bell. Well, maybe a little. He got a little suspicious, so he says, I reflexively did some basic security hygiene checks. The email was from a Cambridge, University of Cambridge, cam.ac.uk email address. There was a link to know more about the Adam Smith Prize. It, it, the link was on the uh, Cambridge domain. Uh, he said, it struck me as a little odd. The page was hosted inside somebody's personal directory instead of on the main site. But, well, maybe less bureaucracy. So he clicked the link and read a little bit about the history of the prize. That was his mistake. Can you, can you pinpoint the mistake at this point? He clicked on the link. Yeah. He said, if the person sending this email had added seven extra words to this page, I would have been screwed. This page must be viewed in Firefox. The reason is there's a zero day. It's been fixed. But there was a zero day in Firefox that allowed a bad guy, a, mal a malformed web page, to attack your Firefox and steal all your passwords stored in Firefox. It's been used against the folks at Coinbase and to with great effect. Uh, and I guess it was being used against even more than that. He didn't see any problems, so he emailed him back. He went back and forth. He did say, I'm curious, uh, why did you ask, uh, who recommended me? <laughs> uh, Gregory, not his real name, replied, uh, we got a candidate's list from uh, San Francisco State. Uh, I will now. He says I'm starting to worry. He says probably there's another guy with a similar name sitting in his office wondering why he didn't be at, wasn't being asked to judge. <laughs> he says hi, Gregor. I'm starting to wonder if some wires got crossed. I mean, I've read some books by Paul Krugman, but I'm I'm not an economist. I'm a software engineer. Is there another Robert Heaton in San Francisco who knows more about economics? And then Gregory. Yeah, uh, might be a mistake. I'll get back to you, and that's the last he heard from him. Until he so, got I think that this, I think this type of phishing email is the kind of thing that would get through something like an Office 365 because it's a link. It went to a, it went to a legitimate link, and it was obviously a compromised directory that now, was used to right. push them out. There. Here's how it might have, because remember that, and you've got this. I know you, you as you surf around the net, you'll get an error. Google say mm -hmm. this page has malware, right? So, so they are they are scanning. There are databases. Uh, Edge uses it. Chrome uses it. Firefox and others use it. Obviously, that wasn't that page wasn't flagged because he was able to go to it without a flag. So maybe you're right. right. If it's if it's fresh, right? It's fresh. If it's fresh. Then right. If then it's you, a zero and, day. And it came from a legitimate U a URL. And it was a zero day, and that's I guess right. the real point. I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's that's the really scary part, right, is that this was a zero day that um, was able to be exploited that quickly. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, and if they had put has to be viewed, although, I mean, I think there's something to be said has to be viewed in Firefox, but probably in some cases hopefully raise suspicions. Like I know for me, if I were to read something that said you have to, to view this link in this browser and I don't know who it's from, I would like to think, I can't guarantee this, I mean, I, I easily could have fallen victim of this too, I would like to think that I would think to myself, wait a minute, like, why are they, you know, telling me that I have to use this browser? Or I would disregard it and try to use the browser I typically use anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's it, it's scary for sure. Uh, I think the, the thing here too is the fact that it's able to grab, it was able to grab the passwords from, you know, Firefox's um, browser. Um, this is probably another uh, good kind of, again, diversification of security, you know, uh, stuff is I I tend to try to store all my passwords in my password. Never manager, use your browser um, to store your I passwords. Don't, exactly. Yeah. I've actually gotten yeah. to the point where I I've removed it from all my browsers because I've been worried about things like that. Now seeing this again, I'm gonna like double down on that. Like anything that's important anyway, I certainly don't want to store my browser, even it's though it's so convenient. scary. Because this is I don't know. I mean, any one of us could have fallen for this. Totally. Right? Yeah. Yep. Uh. Did you, uh, we, I, was it, when was it, uh, was it this week? I guess it was that, uh, Cloudflare for three hours was offline. <laughs> and that was like, what Cloudflare? This is, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, internet backbone for so many sites to keep them safe from DDoS attacks. It wasn't a DDoS attack. It was a bad BGP route. This is such a 
horrific story. And it's happened. What's really horrific is it keeps happening. So the border gateway protocol is a protocol, and I am not an expert on this. Steve, I think, did a better job explaining this on security now. But in general, uh, you can use a, a router to broadcast your route to the Internet. Mm -hmm. And if it's properly formed, it says, if you want to say, you know, if you want to come to my website, this is how you get here. If it's malformed, you can, in effect, say, all Internet traffic, come to me. And that's what happened. A, a small internet service provider uh, screwed up its BGP route. Actually, it did it because it was using an optimizer, and the optimizer screwed it out. It's a DQE Communications, an ISP in Pennsylvania. They used the optimizer and essentially published a route that said all internet traffic should go through a small company in, in Pennsylvania called Allegheny Technologies. Now, the transit provider for DQE was a little company you might have heard of called Verizon. Verizon then <laughs> broadcast that route uh, worldwide. Yep. Uh, Cloudflare noticed it, as you might expect they did, and they then they tracked it down, and uh, they figured out it was coming through Verizon. Uh, they they tried to reach Verizon. <laughs> nobody nobody answered their emails. <laughs> they actually in their blog post they published. The phone calls, the emails, they uh, urgent route leak from your customer. Here's the phone yeah. calls they made to DO, DQE's knock to Verizon to Verizon engineers. They tried pager duty. They tried to wake up everybody. Finally, DQE responded. Uh, three hours later, they were able to <laughs> fix this. But whoop, is that me? I think maybe Verizon's on the line. Uh, but I, this is in the Cloudflare blog post. How could this leak have been prevented? There are multiple ways <laughs> this leak could have been avoided. Uh, for instance, you can configure your session to have a hard limit of prefixes to be received. So if all of a sudden the entire internet arrives at your door, you go, oops, and you take that route offline. Had Verizon had such a prefix limit in place, none of this would have happened. It doesn't cost a provider like Verizon anything to have such limits in place, and there's no good reason other than sloppiness or laziness that they wouldn't have them. There's other ways to do it, IRR filtering. There's, there's, mm -hmm. there's an RPKI framework that prevents this. It has happened before. It probably will happen again. We've, we're losing people right and left here. I, we just lost Dwight. Now all three of you have fallen off <laughs> Skype, Skype. <laughs> Must be uh, having some of these problems, too. Anyway, it's just a, another caution, a second cautionary tale. We really got to get uh, people to do the right thing and protect the Internet. This is ridiculous. This this should never have happened. And no, it never should have happened. And then it's really frustrating that, that, that Verizon, it took them three hours to, like, get back in touch three with Three hours! Them. Like... like there should, I mean, you would think that with one of the biggest backhauls like in the world, should there should be an easier way to like, because obviously they use pager duty. Obviously they have people who are yes. on call for these purposes. For partners who are the size of Cloudflare, I would like to think that they would be able to have that direct line. You know, that's, Actually, that's kind of I should point out Cloudflare says Verizon never got back to them. It was DQE, the internet service provider. They were finally able to work with their engineers and fix it. Verizon, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we're 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 too busy. <laughs> we can't handle that. Also, a great story in Bloomberg Business Week this week about the hotel hackers hiding in the remote control curtains. Uh, it's a fun story. They actually hired uh, white hat hackers to try to penetrate a hotel. They won't mention hotels are very vulnerable. This is mostly a story about why you shouldn't. You should be uh, careful not to give any company too much information and you certainly shouldn't use open wi-fi networks at hotels or coffee shops you should use a vpn especially uh mm -hmm. on these networks because mm, yeah no you definitely should although it's, it's it sure is a shame that when you check into an international hotel they require you give them your passport oh i know but they do and they keep i them. know they keep them i know they do and they keep them and does and, that make you then, feel squirrely yes this is what I'm saying. Like, this is all great advice. Don't give too much information. Don't do this and that. Yeah, but it's they like, get yeah. your passport. But, but yeah, but they yeah. get your passport anyway. Like, yeah. and they have your address. They, ha you know what I mean? Like, I 1,000 percent agree with that. But it, there's a certain irony that at the base level, <sighs> at the top, all, I mean, as we saw with the um, um, Marriott hack, um, 
I was like, and, and I'm, I'm one of those bomb boy, like ambassador people. I was like, Oh yeah, great. I'm really, really happy. Oh yeah. They got all my information too. I, I've been a yeah, long time like, Starwood like, member. I was a long time Starwood person. I was like, yeah. wonderful. I'm really, really glad between that and Equifax. I'm like, well, my identity is screwed. Hey, I'm happy to say that at least one Equifax uh, executives get in jail time. Yeah. Less than, less than Martha Stewart. Yeah. And, and by the way, not for the breach, but because he insider traded. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Less than, <laughs> le he, and he got less than Martha Stewart did for taking he got four months, probably in one of those country club jails. Um, the, was it the, the, the uh, CFO? C anyway, he. Uh, CIO, it was the CIO. The CIO, that's right. And, he, and it was great too, because the, the, I mean, he pleaded guilty, which I'm sure is part of why his sentence was so good, but they had him dead to rights. He literally researched what the impact was on other companies uh, of a stocks. breach, of a data breach. Yes, yes. and and then when he <laughs> before, realized, he like, before oh. it was publicly announced, we should point Completely. out. Yes, and then he was like, "Oh, this is going to be bad for me. I'm 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 not going to make as much money." So he sold his stock and 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 made you know like sixty thousand dollars or something by selling it when he did. Uh, I hope he yeah. made more than that because he's going to have to pay one hundred seventeen thousand dollars in restitution and a fifty five thousand dollar fine, in addition to yeah. four months in jail. And I don't care if it's a country club jail. Four months in jail is. No, no picnic. No, it's not. But, you know, like for all the things they do, it's like, OK, I mean, he's the CIO. So if, if there's a certain. I Yeah, I don't have any. Uh, yeah. Good riddance, dude. No, I would like to see <laughs> I would like to see more more consequences to the folks at Equifax. Actually, he made four hundred eighty thousand yeah. dollars and avoided a loss of one hundred seventeen thousand dollars. That's why that was the fine. Mm. That's why that was the fine. Well, you're going to get that loss anyway. And free meals from the state for four months. Uh, FCC has allowed Verizon to... Now, remember, Verizon didn't doesn't lock its cell phones because of a consent degree. Decree right, because the of, FCC. Because of a, right, because of the... the um, 700 megahertz uh, spectrum. Yes, the spectrum stuff, yep. yep. But now they can. But now they can. But that's only two months. And they will auto unlock. That's the good thing. Like, though, I'm a Verizon customer begrudgingly, and um, I am at least happy. Like, this is frustrating, especially for people who do go internationally or whatever. But this is yep. uh, at least it's only two months, and they'll auto unlock. What's always frustrated me before, like with AT and T and some of the others, is you have to call them, and even if you bought it outright, they'll give you the runaround before they'll unlock your phone. And you're like, okay, but I'm going to another country. Oh, we'll just pay our inflated rate. I'm like, no, but I don't want to do that so that's at least i guess good that it'll be auto unlock but it is disappointing that that they're able to auto lock that they're able to lock people's phones their um excuse for this which they and by the way they've been locking them before sale as well their excuse for it is to prevent theft but t-mobile had none of it they told the fcc eh, there's no evidence this limited action would have the desired effect during the 60-day period a fraudulent party would merely be required to make a payment of about forty dollars, and, right. and Verizon would unlock it. Right. So if there's no evidence this is going to do anything. I don't know. Verizon, I think, probably would just like to slowly increase this from sixty days to ninety days. No, that's totally what they to want. They want. They don't days. want people. To, sure. They don't want people to leave your network, right? right? Like they don't want people buying their phones and then able to to use them on another on another network. And it's like, okay, but as long as I'm paying my bill, then why do you care? Exactly. This matters even less, you know, now in the old days where you bought a phone and it was subsidized, mm -hmm. like you could make a certain argument. Um, yeah, they, 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 it's their yeah, phone still. still. Right. During the subsidy and, period. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah. But now where you're not, that's just not a thing anymore. And you are essentially, you know, leasing this phone, but you are paying for it. Um, and, and a lot of times not directly to the carrier, right? Um, sometimes it's to whatever the third party is. So, right. yeah, it's it's really not cool that the the SIM locking thing is is still a thing. Would love to see the FCC take a stronger hand in in making SIM locking. Um, oh yeah, it, illegal. I mean, you mean, yeah. You mean you mean with our our current FCC chair, who's a former Verizon executive? Yeah, I, 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 I definitely <laughs> yeah. think not going to happen. Of course, I definitely not gonna think happen. that's going to happen. Chance. Um, yeah, no, but not going to happen. But would love to see. I believe they should do that. That is something. Yes, that is a place where the too. FCC should step in. No, I one thousand percent agree. I mean, and and. You know, and it's interesting, um, but at this point, you know, people have moved to these payment plans like, uh, you know, Apple obviously has their own. And if you get your phone through Apple, then you 
it's unlocked by whatever. But then Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile will have their own kind of payment plans where they'll say, oh, you know, you just have to pay an extra $20 on your bill. And for some people that can be more convenient than having to get a secondary, you know, contract agreement with another company. Um, but I, I think that that really is kind of the the best case scenario for consumers if you can get it directly through your phone manufacturer and you can avoid the carrier altogether. That's probably best. Our show today brought to you by LegalZoom. LegalZoom is awesome. I, we've been using LegalZoom. We started Twit with LegalZoom, the, the the corporation or this LLC, but the LLC papers. I asked Kevin Rose. I said, "What you know? I want to start a business. You you're experienced in this. What should we do?" He said, "Go to LegalZoom, and they will do that because I can't afford a lawyer. They will do all the documents for you. It's great. They'll do LLCs, DBAs, S corp." Um, and by the way, you can also do your will there, your last will or living trust. We we They have a friends and family discount right now, and I want you to take advantage of it because it's almost too late. LegalZoom's not a law firm. I want to make this clear. Although they do have a network, they've organized a nationwide network of independent attorneys who can provide actual advice from attorneys for your business. But what their whole idea was to create, there's a lot of stuff that's paperwork so that you can get a lot of the stuff done Business formation, wills and trusts, intellectual property. We did our trademarks with LegalZoom. You could just do with LegalZoom, save huge amounts of money. And then if you need a lawyer, no problem. They have lawyers that pre-negotiated flat fee prices with them all over the country. Don't wait another minute putting off the things you need to get done. There is, uh, I mean, I wish we didn't need lawyers, but it's true. We do. We need paperwork. This has to happen. And if you're starting a business, if you don't have a will, uh, you've got to do this. Visit LegalZoom.com right now. The friends and family discount is 10% when you use the offer code TWIT at the checkout. So please use the offer code TWIT. That lets them know you heard it here, which helps us. And they say it's not going to last long. So do it right now. LegalZoom.com, offer code TWIT. LegalZoom is where life meets legal. Uh, and we wouldn't even exist if it weren't for LegalZoom. So I'm really happy to tell you all about it. LegalZoom.com, don't forget to use the offer code Twit. Um, I'm not real happy about Grubhub. Did you see this? There. Oh yeah, that was that's sleazy. That's so sleazy. So the, apparently they're buying up restaurant web addresses uh, for rep restaurants that you don't use Grubhub, I guess. No, no, it's even worse. Sometimes it's that don't use them, but a lot of times it's web addresses that do use them and it will take them to their Grubhub page and the Grubhub phone number. So if you call to order, you're actually going through Grubhub. Which oh. means Grubhub Commission. And not the what restaurant itself, is, right? Right, because a lot of the restaurants themselves, they'll use Grubhub, um, which also owns Seamless, because it can be more convenient and they handle a lot of back-end things, but it costs them a lot of money. And I know that when I was in New York City, um, you know, where Seamless rules the the whole kind of space very frequently a lot of the delivery places would have things inside the food saying please order directly from our website because they you know can get better um you know they don't have to pay as much um, money there and, and their margins um, are, are a lot better so the idea would be okay i google this restaurant and rather than going to the page that has their own delivery system which might cost them less money instead grubhub is is buying their a very similar domain name and trying to filter everything through them. This um, is a, kind of an expose because. published in New Food Economy at newfoodeconomy.org. Grubhub sent them a statement saying, Grubhub has never cyber squatted, which is identified by ICANN as a generally bad faith registration of another person's trademark and a domain name as a service to our restaurants. We have right. created we have created microsites for them as another source of orders and to increase their online brand presence. Additionally, we have registered domains on their behalf, consistent with our restaurant contracts. We no longer provide that service. And it's always been our practice to transfer the domain to the restaurant as soon as so, they request it. So I actually ran into this a couple of weeks ago where I ordered some Chinese food near the Chronicle for lunch. And I had done this before online with this particular restaurant, and I would go to their website, and they would have their own system. I went, I Googled their website and clicked on a link, and it took me to a Grubhub site. And it was not the restaurant itself, and I thought, wait a minute. And so I manually typed in the URL, which I knew, and it took me back to them. And then when I clicked on their order online, it took me to a Grubhub embed page 
on their site. But my initial trip, my initial click took me to this Grubhub thing that didn't look right. It had almost looked oh, like it had so, been hijacked. So this actually happened to you. So the, yeah, the reason yeah. this works is because Grubhub's contracts with the restaurant give them a higher commission if the customer comes through Grubhub to the restaurant as opposed. Yep. So if you go to the restaurant page and order, even if Grubhub, Grubhub delivers it, they don't make as much money as if you go through Grubhub to get to them. So it makes sense. And that's what I wound up doing. I wound yeah. up yeah. using the, the embedded version. Yeah. So it's really, it's just so not cool because, you know, for example, there's, um, there's a small business, uh, owner not far from here that owns like a smoothie and sandwich shop. And, um, I, I was, they, they started taking one of these services, right. Um, recently. And I was asking him just cause they, they're, they're great. And a lot of us go there and I was just like, how's that going? You know, just what, what, you know, is there a good reason to do it? And they're like, look, we think of that as 80% of a sale, right? Because the, the service takes 20% of that sale um, in this case, 80% uh, of a sale that we wouldn't have gotten anyway. So for us, we're willing to do it. We take a smaller margin, um, but that's why we're, we're willing to. But if that's a customer that would have come to them anyway, and then they're getting redirected mm -hmm. and basically Grubhub's taking that, they're really taking money straight out of the pocket of small business owners who are working on small margins, who are just trying to make it, uh, you know, and trying to uh, live off of this and pay, you know, their employees. And so it's just so not cool. It's in such bad faith that they would do it. It just makes you not want to do business with a company that would, that would you know, try to literally just take money out of the no pocket kidding. of small business this is uh, no, so this is an example this is uh there's a in daytona beach there's a, a sub shop called molly hatchets there uh, which is a great name their uh url is molly hatchets sub .com, and if you go there you'll get the real molly hatchets page which, where they have their own or online ordering system not a grubhub system but there is a grubhub page they made molly hatchets sub shop daytona beach .com, where the order goes through Grubhub, and of course they make a lot more money. In fact, they don't make any money if you use Molly Hatchet's order system. So yeah. that that is kind of that's I think that's close to the main squatting. Uh, I, I I definitely think so. I, I yes. mean, you know, and and I like seamless Grubhub. I use them a lot, but that's I'm not a fan of this in the slightest. And yeah. and especially since, you know, uh, that uh, article um and I read it, I was not familiar with that publication, but it's really good. They've, you know, talked to some, you know, business owners who have seen the fees can increase, uh, you know, increase over the years and they've had to kind of, you know, it's impacted their businesses quite a bit. Like it really makes you kind of, it, it's gross, right? Cause like they're, they're already, they have a good service. And, and it's one of those things where a lot of, I think restaurants would use them anyway, knowing, like Jason was saying, knowing the trade-offs, but this is, this is going into another direction. Like this is literally trying to use your own SEO, your own purposes to, you know, take, you know, to, this to is the next. This is like Uber, isn't it? It's the next area where these companies. There's a lot of competition. They're moving into markets. Do you? What do you use in Seattle? I use I use seamless Grubhub. Um, we don't have great delivery stuff, but I use yeah. that. I mean, sometimes Uber Eats or whatever. But yeah. Jason, do you ever use these services? Yep. Um, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Seamless, Grubhub. They're all um, here in, in Louisville. So you see the competition say, and, and, yep, and, totally. and, and it's tough. I mean, how do you decide that day? Is it by restaurant or? It's, it's, it, sometimes it depends on, for me, like what the delivery fee is going to be, to be oh, totally honest. Okay. Like a <laughs> lot of times it does tend to be cheaper on Seamless, but sometimes for instance, like Postmates will have a, a better deal with, or an arrangement with somebody or DoorDash will. Um, and, and sometimes Uber Eats has like a, a promo. So how about you, you know, Jason? I, I is there, that. is there a, what criteria do you use to decide? They're they're all pretty the pretty much the same, but they the different restaurants will use different ones, and so yeah. sometimes it just depends on the restaurant. So if I know what I want to eat, I'll yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it's such a, it's such a tough business that Amazon got out of it. Yeah, Amazon sure is doing these kind of deliveries, and they they decided they didn't want a piece of it, and they walked away from. That's it. surprising, since they're already driving to my house every day yeah. anyway. Well, that was <laughs> That's the thing. Right. they were trying to use that. Um, it, it, to be fair, the Amazon food thing, at least when I tried it, was not good at all. Uh, it was expensive compared to the others, and usually, you know, you waited longer, and then their restaurant selection was not good. But yeah, you're exactly right, Dwight. They they were like, "Peace, we're out of this." So right. funny when I was growing I, up. I I'm hate sure to say it. Go ahead. So I was just going to say, I, I hate to say it, but because because I'm not a fan of Uber, like if I have to, yeah. I use Lyft whenever possible, Same. never use Uber unless I have no choice but anything else. But 
Uber Eats is actually the, Eats of is the really ones good. that I've used. They're the they're the best. They're the most reliable. Yes. They get it there the fast. They're the app they're is just the best. Uber drivers doing delivery, right? Is that it's right. the same yeah. people, right? Yeah. Um, usually, sometimes I think that, like, I believe the background checks and stuff are different for Uber Eats versus yeah. Uber you, because they're it's literally okay just if you, if you, you. Kid me, kidnap my egg foo young. It's not the end of the world. <laughs> it, inter, well, it might be. Internationally, it, it's a lot of a lot of um, kids on on mopeds oh, internationally. Like when I've done it in France and in yeah, um, and, and, or maybe yeah, Spain, France, I should say. Yeah, there's Deliveroo uh, uh, internationally in the UK and in a lot of other countries. There's some other ones. It's amazing yeah, uh, how this has changed because, I mean, Dwight, right? It was just pizza for the longest time. Right. <laughs> we have, what's, at, when the Chronicle moved from downtown out to a, uh, uh, not necessarily suburban, but a rather further out location, we were kind of, a, you have to get in your car to go somewhere to get any food. Right. And so uh, they, we have two services here that are very interesting. We have one called Lunch Drop, where every day there are two different restaurants, and you can choose from the complete menu of either of these two restaurants, and you pay, and there's a very small delivery fee because they're bringing items in in bulk, and you can get one from either of these restaurants, and they usually arrive you know, hot and it's fresh. Uh, and then there's also a company called Fuda that comes in and uh, and allows uh, places, restaurants to set up pop-up shops in our cafeteria area. Cool. So uh, we have like a Chick-fil-A from down the road comes in and sells Chick-fil-A. Oh, we yes. have a bunch of, bunch of barbecue places that come oh. in. This and those are good. Uh, we have a lot of Asian. We have a lot of uh, halal uh, comes in. So every day there's a different restaurant in the building, and oh, you cool. you order through an app. You know, you go in, you Me. pick what you want, you uh, show them your barcode, and you walk away with I'm it. And so, so I'm uh, so impressed. We talk a lot about you know economic struggles and stuff, but uh, I this is where all the innovation is happening now, right? Is in mm -hmm. is it? It's almost it's a new. Service. It's, it's almost a, it's a service. It's, a, it's like a new economy. And it's springing up everywhere, and people see. I mean, that's very specific to your area, Dwight. Because right. I mean, they don't. They wouldn't do that here because we're there's plenty. Of, there's an IHOP next door. But but right. for you, and I imagine a lot of businesses in Houston, that's a sensible right. business. And right. we're what do you, out. what is it, what is empowering this? Is it the fact that the internet and apps and computer in your pocket make it so easy to, for this kind of stuff to happen? Back to the first story. It is smartphones. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, it's, it's and and it's things like you know that came out of that like like Stripe right or not Stripe um, uh, Square like just you know and which is a great example of being able to finally collect payments you know you don't have to have that huge POS system right. you know food trucks and right. other places can now just everybody have a uses connector. everybody uses Square now right totally right. my yeah. wife the psychotherapist uses Square yeah. to take. Uh, to How long care. before we get rid of the credit card and start using oh. Apple Pay or Venmo or some sort of all digital or Facebook Zuckbucks? I mean, the cre <laughs> the idea of a of a stripe or a swipe with a credit card in the square is kind of yeah. Well, they're already just contactless. With oh, they're square. they're already using yeah, iPhone. And, uh, yeah, I was gonna and say yep. it's really cool to go to Europe where every place takes contactless. Um, wow. And uh, my yeah. Rose Gold American Express card does support that, which is nice. And like, and they've had that for years. You know, they look at things like Apple Pay and they're like. Ugh. That's, you know. Oh, I know. I We're just catching up. We still, right. oh, I know. until last year, you had to sign your name. Like that was some magic incantation right. that would guarantee this is really you. <laughs> that was crazy. Let me take one more break. There's still some things to talk, lots of things to talk about. What a great panel, though. Christina Warren, Film Girl is here. Uh, in fact, you know, Simone is going to be on the yes. show next week. I'm so excited. We're she, so excited about she that. Has She's never done it before. Of course, Simone de Rochefort, along with Brianna Wu, co-host Rocket with uh, Christina. And she's never been in our shows. I've never even met her. So I'm really excited. Oh I, she's she, so good. I love her on Rocket. So, yeah. That, are you going to give her some tips before she comes on? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. She's a little nervous, but she's going to do great. And you're going to love her. Tell and, her to uh, have all her purses her. hanging up behind her. <laughs> <laughs> Is she French? Um, originally her parents are, or her dad, I think okay. is, but, uh, yeah, so we're doing it, I think an all French episode next week. Cause it's Patrick Beja, Simone de Rochefort, Leo Laporte. And who's this, who's the, uh, the fourth person. There's another French person. Who is it? Paris Martineau. And right. Micah Sargent. He's the wild card. We're throwing Micah in cause we're very pleased to uh, have announced today that we just hired Micah Sargent, who is this oh, that's wonderful. nicest oh, wow. guy ever. Used to Congratulations. work for. Congratulations! I love Micah so Isn't much. Isn't he great? 
Yes. He, yes, he worked for iMore, and we loved him at iMore. But and I I don't want to poach because Renee Ritchie is is a, a regular on MacBreak Weekly, and I love the iMore team. But but when iMore uh, shrank a little bit, they did some layoffs, and Micah became available. We said, oh, we we. The only trick was getting him and his Chihuahuas to move out here. But he's gonna. <laughs> so I'm very excited. I don't know how the Chihuahuas are gonna like it, but I know he'll be very happy here. Oh, I'm so excited! I love him. No, he, yeah. he and I used to do a podcast, uh, Did you? a cartoon cast together. Yeah, he does like we a million podcasts. I know we weren't able to keep it up, but it was it was a lot of fun, and he's wonderful. I love him so much. He's got great um, energy. Him, yeah. Ask him sometime to to tell you about the time uh, his iPad was stolen, and and oh. I almost went uh, uh, like full on like. Anyway, we, we, we tried to track the, the thieves down. Let's just put it that way. Ask them to tell you about that. <laughs> Never. Don't do that. That's <laughs> no, we very didn't, dangerous. But, but I, 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 was, I, was very, I, I was very upset for my friend having his, his uh, device stolen at a party. Uh, the the so, only thing yeah. Micah wanted to know is if he could bring his chihuahuas to work. And I said, if you don't bring your chihuahuas to work, I'll be mad at you. Hmm. We will now be chihuahua powered. <laughs> Jason Hire is also here. Uh, congratulations on his new gig. He couldn't tell us about it last time. Editorial director of CNET Advice. Big, big. Is that a big promotion for you, Jason? Uh, yeah. I mean, you got the corner CNET office. Is, is such a, um, you know, a a big and important brand in CBS Interactive portfolio. So, uh, you know, it's it's just a great opportunity to work with so many awesome people. Um, got a team of terrific folks who. Uh, Actually, would be wonderful guests on a lot of your shows. We can talk about that oh, later. You know, let's talk. People like Dan Ackerman and David Katzmeyer I'd and Jessica to. Dolcourt. And, oh, I know yeah, Jessica. That would be great. Of course, yeah. your your boss Lindsay Turntine's a regular on Twit, so it's a good that's a good crew over there. You know, I was the third employee, third or fourth employee of CNET. Did you know that? I know. Oh, you wrote the book about me. I forgot. That's amazing. I did not know that. Oh, uh, my, my, my boss, uh, Jeff Sanquist, would also like to come on anytime you would want him, oh. uh, Leo. So. Oh, uh, 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 hired or whatever it is that we do. He's booked. Uh, just send me an email or send Car best as can Karsten Bondi an email because I don't even look we'll at my do. email. Uh, and also Dwight Silverman, who for a long time, he said, I don't want to do tech anymore. I'm just a, a reporter now at the Houston Chronicle. We had to say goodbye to him. Thank God he went back to tech with Tech Burger. And now he's uh, once again a regular. Houston Chronicle. They pulled me Tech back Burger. in. You can't get out of That's it, right. can you? No, I cannot. And and as I said earlier, I'm expanding with the newsletter release notes at HoustonChronicle.com slash release notes. Oh, Sign I up. subscribe to that right now. Yeah. HoustonChronicle.com slash release notes. And it's going to be very personal. It's not just like, a, you're, like reporting. It's going to be personal. Well. So what we're going to do is the uh, the first item in it is actually going to be a story or a column that will appear only in the newsletter uh, for an exclusive period of time, oh, and then nice. will show up on the website, and then later in print, and we'll do uh, kind of the best links of the web for the week, kind of a this week in tech uh, uh, style. Uh, I'll also talk about great places to eat in Houston and uh, and uh, TV shows I'm binge watching and some products that I like. And then uh, we will also have pictures of my cats each week. And it's free. And it's free. This That's is the right. hotness. The new hotness is due to newsletter. We're doing a lot of newsletters. Yeah. One of our one of our uh, favorite ones right now is uh, for the moon landing. Uh, we've got a newsletter called Space Junk, oh. and we have a podcast called Cigarettes and Rocket Fuel that uh, takes place in the 1960s in the walk up to the landing on the moon. I, so we're having this, a great time. That's, oh, that's, that's awesome. July. It's coming Whoa. up. The 50th yep. anniversary. Yep. That's really exciting. There's a wonderful website uh, that I um, mentioned a while ago that is a timeline of the Apollo 11 launch. Oh, yeah, like a real-time timeline. It's line. in real time. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I don't know if you've seen the Apollo 11 movie, which was amazing. Um, but the, there is, it turns out, a lot of footage, including like Cinerama quality 4K footage, film footage, of it and it was and it's really cool um so what they did if i can find it uh, i don't know where it is um is they there's so much there's hours and hours of mission control recordings you know the the there's all this right. footage nobody's ever seen from all the different cameras and they just put it in this timeline 
uh, which is a, a brilliant idea that you can in re you can participate in real time if you wanted. You'd start right now, and you'd go up to what is it? J uh, July eleventh is the landing. July twentieth. Twentieth. July twentieth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you could you could have it running in the background uh, at all time, but I it's there's a lot. Unfortunately, if I'm searching Apollo eleven timeline, there's like eight hundred of these. Oh, here's an interactive timeline. Let's see if this is it. Is this the one? No, there's quite a few of these, though. Well, I guess I found a num number of. Yeah, them. it's very it's very elaborate, and uh, you kind of have to learn how to use it. But it's uh, it's it's an excellent resource. Yeah, I love reliving. You know, you and I are of an age. These young guys, they don't know, but you and I <laughs> remember it. I don't. Know, I think I would expect you to. I certainly do. I sat in front of our Phil our yep. Philco yep. Futura television yep. set. Uh, with a uh, my reel to reel recorder recording the audio uh -huh. of the landing because yep. I wanted to have it. Yep. And I was 13, I yep. believe. Yep. Time. Same age as me. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who could forget that? I mean, that is that uh, that uh, that informed our whole uh, life, I would say. And we and frankly, it's the greatest thing humans ever did. One of the greatest. Short of the iPhone. Short of yeah, the but iPhone. except for the iPhone. <laughs> Here's some happy news. The 737 MAX software, you know, this is the Boeing jet that's been grounded now for quite a while. They keep finding more problems with it, and maybe now we know why. Oh, my God. This uh, Boeing was laying off engineers, yeah, trying to cut costs, and outsourcing the software for their jet to temporary workers overseas making as little as $9 an hour. These are the same engineers that provided patch updates for Huawei equipment. <laughs> uh, this is terrifying. And it's also very sad. You're up in Boeing country. Boeing was yep. legendary, Christina, yeah. for yes. being engineers, rigorous engineers who would do it right no matter what. And then they decided to cut costs. Uh, lo Longtime Boeing engineers told Bloomberg that the effort was complicated by a push to outsource work to lower paid contractors. Um, and it may have cost many, many lives. And that's very sad. Um, in fact, uh, Bloomberg did a good job of tracking this down because they were they were looking at they used social media check resumes posted by Indian uh, engineers in, in the, if a company uh, called HCL, uh, and many of them had on their resume, they helped des design and test Boeing's Max flight display software. Another Indian company handled software for the flight test equipment. So, in fact, it was much less efficient because the coders from HCL Technologies uh, were designing the specifications from Boeing. So it added an extra step. In fact, it took many rounds, according to one engineer, going back and forth because the code wasn't done right. That's not a reflection on, on on the engine, the Indian engineers, by any means. But no, not yeah. at all. But but they they're they're hiring out you know contractors and vendors um, for something that of this mu utmost importance Safety is, should be is done in house. One. Exactly. Job one. Precisely. Yes. Job one. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say we should be careful with that. There's a lot of amazing software engineers in India. There are there are some of the best you know absolutely. IT. Without a doubt, um, it has nothing to do with that. in the world. It's, it's just a flawed, well, yeah. a flawed way to do it, which is design the it's specs in Seattle, awesome. send it to India, and not only, uh, you know, at different time zone engineers who are not maybe as experienced, uh, if they're making $5 an hour, which was the going rate at the time. Uh, it's how, a, it's how, a process problem. It's a process problem, I guess. Yes. Yeah. We've seen this happen so many times in so many American companies where they outsource and the results are not good. Uh, let's see. 53 essential tech bro terms. <laughs> <laughs> How to speak Silicon Valley. This is from The Guardian. And uh, there are a few that I think, every, you know, we know, if you listen to our shows, you hear Angel Investor and Apple and <laughs> Autopilot all the time. You know these terms. Well, let's look at their definition of tech bro to start. Tech bro. Noun, a U.S. born, college educated, Patagonia clad male whose entry level salary at one of the FANG companies, oh, that's defined somewhere else Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google at one of the FANG companies was at least. $125,000 and frequently assists his female co-workers give him high fives. 
typically works in product <laughs> management or marketing. Had he been born 10 years earlier, he would have been a finance bro instead. Accurate? Accurate? Accurate. Absolutely. <laughs> I love this one. Thought leader. Those are the guys you see in the TED Talks all the time. I'm a thought leader. An unemployed rich person. <laughs> <sighs> it's funny because it's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the president's tweets might be, uh, you next time you look at the president's tweets, you might see a gray box. Twitter has finally somehow <laughs> addressed the conundrum of what do you do if the leader of the free world doesn't follow your rules you can't kick them off the platform so they're rolling out a new notice for tweets belonging to public figures that break the community guidelines uh what they do is they'll give you a gray box that says the twitter rules about abusive behavior apply to this tweet however twitter has learned it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain available and then they have a button view yeah something tells me that Trump is going to somehow not be subject to any of you think these they things. Want, they say they'll only do it to people who are politicians, verified users, or accounts with more than 100,000 followers. You're right. It's not going to happen to the president. No, it'll be other lower level politicians. Uh, but no, the president is, is. And can I just point out, if you're browsing along on Twitter and you see that, who's not going to click view? Yeah, totally. it's, it's <laughs> like. It's yeah. an advertisement. Yeah. Totally. Pay attention to this tweet. It's forbidden fruit, you know, forbidden right fruit. there. I think but the bigger thing is that it won't be used. Bit. Right, that's what I was going to say. They won't be the in the searches, thing. right? Something right. like that. Right. Yeah. It won't be surfaced yeah, in, the, in the uh, in the True. the trending at trending feed. It's a little like uh, YouTube taking away your monetization. Slap on the wrist. <laughs> if, if, if you're big enough to cause damage, then it doesn't work. But if you're smaller, like I think right. monetization, demonetization actually does work. I think that for people who have their own income streams, it's a different scenario. But for a lot of smaller creators, not being able to monetize is actually a pretty good way of shutting down people, you know. And let's um, end it's our true. show yes. today with this picture of dozens of drivers Dozens of Colorado drivers <laughs> stuck in the mud. This is a great story. <laughs> because Google Maps <laughs> routed oh, no. them into a mud pit. Oh, no. Apparently, the uh, road to the Denver airport was uh, closed due to a crash on Pena Boulevard. So Google Maps suggested a detour. Of course, a lot of people rushing to the airport to catch a flight or pick up travelers. The detour <laughs> took them to a dirt road. Uh, near the border of Denver and Aurora. She wasn't immediately concerned. They're quoting uh, Connie Monsies. Uh, thanks to crowd psychology. My thought was, well, all these other cars are in front of me, so it must be okay. <laughs> then the dirt road turned into a muddy slop. That's when I thought, oh, this was a bad decision. A hundred <laughs> cars had taken the detour, ended up in the muddy, empty field. By the way, there's the shotgun blasted road closed sign that's fallen over <laughs> and apparently nobody Jeez. nobody paid by the way every roadside in colorado is shotgun oh, blasted it's i'm so sure good. it's true in houston oh, too man uh, <laughs> love that picture <laughs> so so is this a case is this one of those places where google maps has been pulling in features from ways is this one of those cases because ways will give you detours, sometimes that are very bizarre to get you around things. Yeah, I've is done this, some really uh, weird ways do tours in the details in the past. Yeah. Um, it's also saved me a zillion times too. Off, yeah, I've never uh, had yeah. a problem. Yeah. It usually works. It usually but works. what this really underscores is the fact that people are sheep, and if Google tells you to drive totally. into a muddy field. You will. It's, it's literally the, the office when Michael Scott like listens to the GPS on his phone on his a car and drives into um, the lake. <laughs> um, I mean, this is literally what this is. But I mean, what I want to know is how many Ubers this was because this would be terrible regardless. You're going to miss your flight. You're late for the airport. Whatever. But imagine if you're the the person who's in the Uber, who this that you know oh. the, the the Uber driver just followed Google Maps blindly and then you're like. Oh. I mean, for everybody involved there, that would be. Really she terrible. said there were a number of Ubers in the mud. She oh, had a yeah. four wheel drive, so she actually it was really nice of her. She took a, f a bunch of people to the airport. They drove. Oh, through that's the mud really nice. And, mm -hmm. and went on. So that's a great, a great story from uh, the Denver uh, ABC affiliate.
Wow. That's uh, one of those like end of Western civilization, as you know, it, yeah. kind of stories. That <laughs> yeah. people love Idiocracy. <laughs> it's happening. Uh, Hans Zimmer oh, has funny. designed a soundtrack for a new BMW concept car. I'm going to end you end the show with this Hans Zimmer. Can you hear this soundtrack? Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much. I want this car now. That worked. I, I thank you so much for joining us. The great Christina Warren, host of Rocket. You see her on Channel 9 uh, doing uh, cloud advocacy. Where else? Where else, Christina? Anywhere else you want to talk about? Yeah, you can uh, You can go to youtube.com slash Microsoft Developer to see the, the videos that we put out every week. I do a weekly kind of uh, developer news show, and we've got other stuff going on. But uh, yeah, and my podcast, Rocket, uh, that Leo mentioned at uh, Relay FM. So... Are they? They must just love you at Microsoft. I like to think that they like me. I yeah. like them a whole lot. Are you happy there? I am. I am. It's been two years now, and you know, it was. I didn't know how it was going to be making the transition from from journalism to product, and uh, I really like it. And I still get to do things like this. You're nice enough to still let me come oh, on. We and love talk. you, and Christina. So we. I, lo I love you're you guys. The so I, yeah. So I, I I feel like I kind of get the best of both worlds. I get to be more involved in trying to make things better and engage with their communities, but I still get to do my podcasts and, you know, be a, be an idiot on Twitter. So. And I'm sorry, sorry that we didn't get a chance to get to the Taylor uh, Swift, Taylor and Carly uh, thing, but yeah, may maybe okay. next time. Next time. Next time. <laughs> there, will be, there will be some sort of drama next time. I'm sure. I, don't, I don't even know what it is, but all I see is your tweet. I'm glad we finally know what happened to Taylor and Carly. So that's, you know, important spencer pratt responded to me which was wow. a great moment of my life wow. yeah yeah he's, he's famous i take it uh he was he was on the hills yes oh, okay <laughs> yeah yeah leo's like what the audience like what, what is she talking i'm about? so <laughs> not a millennial that's all i can say but neither are you dwight silver and that's why we get along we're of an that's age right. yeah that's right we're the we're the uh grizzled veterans of the tech industry houston chronicle.com slash tech burger what I was gonna say I'm I'm still 24 in spirit. Yeah, me too. Isn't that the weirdest thing about getting old? I still think that's I'm right. younger than Christina. That makes no sense at all. But that's what happens. The body ages, the mind. That's right. A little slower. Uh, we can also find uh, Dwight on his new newsletter. So everybody has to go to HoustonChronicle.com/slash release, release notes, release notes, and subscribe as I have because you. Won't. Thanks, Leo. Yes. Thank you. Great to see you again. And the great Jason Heiner, now in charge of all advice at CNET. <laughs> He's editorial director of Thank CNET you. Advice. That's the reviews. That's all the stuff. That's all the good stuff on CNET. How to. How to. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Features. They, they picked a good person to do it. I'm so glad that you got the corner office. Uh, oh, <laughs> let's, you. And my let's book, not forget Follow the follow Geeks. geeks follow the Geeks. Yeah, thank you. The only memoir, the only bio I'll ever get. <laughs> A great book that uh, Jason uh, wrote about 10 digital innovators in the future of work, uh, along with Lindsay Gilpin. And uh, I'm right. channel, uh, not channel, chapter nine, right? Chapter 10. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's also on Audible. And if you go to Audible and you listen to the sample chapter, the sample chapter is Leo's story. So you oh, get the wow. you get, to, you get, get that for free. The first, for free. You can listen to the first two minutes. Or, oh, or I can't the remember whole how long. Oh. Yeah. You can listen to the first part of Leo's you chapter. You get through the part where I get hired free. at McDonald's. Is that it? That's all you get? <laughs> <laughs> and then I no, became a fry starts. cook at McDonald's. No, I know what it starts it with. Starts, it starts with a great yeah. scene in Las Vegas. Kate Patello and me that's getting out of the car. She's gripping my arm. You've got to read the book to find out why. How's that's that? Right. Very, oh, that's a great plug. Yes. Man. Thank you, Jason. We should, do, we should take this on the road. <laughs> we had a great studio audience today. I thank you all for joining us. We only lost about half of them, so that's pretty good. Yeah, so usually most of them stick around, but sometimes we lose a few during the four-hour episode. Uh, <laughs> if you want to join us in the in the studio, we love having you. Just email tickets at twit.tv. You can also listen or watch live on our live stream, twit.tv slash live. We do this show about 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. Uh, that's 21.30 UTC. Uh, if you want to watch the live stream, then you can see all the stuff before and after the show. Uh, you can also join us in the chat room and talk about what you're seeing chat room a big part of everything we do here at at twit that's irc.twit.tv 
Uh, On-demand versions of our show available at twit.tv, every show we do. And as I said earlier, please subscribe. That way you'll get an episode the minute it's available. Hot off the editor's uh, uh, desk. Fresh. And uh, it, 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 you're, you can use any podcast client you want to do that. Uh, we have all the information at our website, twit.tv slash subscribe. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week. Another with the French episode. Another twit Amazing. is in the can. Bye-bye. <laughs>